Welcome to the school board meeting for Thursday, December 6th. Um, call to order. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Mrs. Glidden? Here. Mr. Gill? Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. Okay, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? Um, just one adjustment. It's going to take a piece of the student representative's report out of 11.0 and move it up into recognition um, because we have a student here who's going to co-present with Kristen uh, about the Internet Club. Great. Are there any public comments on the agenda items? Yes, sir. Oh, please go to the podium. Um, state your name and your address. Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, I just came up with a couple of things here as I was setting upstairs in, in your meeting. Um, the Regional Service Center is on the agenda tonight, and I know that was voted down by the community. And I'm wondering what negative impacts that's going to have on us. It sounded like we were going to get a little bit of synergy by working together with other communities in uh, in southern Maine. Um, I wonder why it didn't pass in this town. I mean, it passed like everywhere else, basically, and I wonder if it's a, a communication problem or a lack of communication that uh, people didn't understand what they're going to be voting on. And I think communication as a whole is something that we have a lot of potential to improve in this town, both at the council level and the school board. Um, a thing that came up as I tried to get the agenda for the finance committee meeting, it was locked. I mean, that makes no sense at all. It was locked so that I couldn't get it, and so I had to add, or you, you gave me the calendar and so forth. Uh, that's certainly not good communication for a public meeting. Um, I think at the board level, as far as communication is concerned, that we have a lack of public input. And I think under that heading of improving communication with everyone in the community is to have a public comment period like the council has, so that the public can get up and address and let you know of things that are on their mind that affect the schools and not just the agenda items. So I would hope that you might consider uh, looking into that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, moving on to recognition. All right, so at this time I will turn it over. I'm just going to, excuse me, clicking through. Look at all this good stuff that's to come for those of you who are staying. Um, I'm just going to fast forward to get to. And I'll turn the mic over to Kristen. Today we are going to present the Interact Club at Scarborough High School. Um, this is Eric Hughes, he's the Vice President of Interact Club, and I'm Kristen Caldwell, and I'm the Middle School Liaison. So Interact Club is the high school branch of Rotary International. Um, it's a community service organization at the high school that um, focuses on both school service and helping students engage with their local <coughs> communities um, by partnering with local organizations to do service events. Um, we have weekly meetings on Wednesdays after school, um, and we aim to have about four to five events per month, um, which gives Interact members the opportunity to participate in as many as 40 events per year. So at the Interact Club at high school, we have seven officers. These fill the roles of two middle school liaisons, one liaison to Rotary Club, and then a secretary, vice president, treasurer, and president. And we have 50 total members and about 20 to 25 regular members who come um, to about every meeting. Uh, so an overview on the hours. Uh, Interact Club members are required to put in 20 hours of community service per year, um, 10 of which must be through the club itself, um, and the other 10 which can come from any other organization in the community. 
uh, we like to think that this relatively low threshold um, encourages students to engage with projects that they have a genuine interest in. Um, because the, the requirement is relatively low, um, it allows students to pick and choose what they actually enjoy. Um, so just as an example, the 2017 to 2018 school year, um, Interact Club had 23 full members, which is um, the amount of members that uh, fulfill the entire service requirement. Um, and these members contributed 329 hours through the club, and that does not include their outside community service. So some of the school event samplings that we have, these are all events that we do in school rather than outside of school through Interact Club. So the first one was freshman orientation. We had students sign up to give tours to freshmen um, on their first day of school. And I took part in this and it was really fun just to show the freshmen around and kind of give them some, give them some insight about our school and what they'll be experiencing for the next four years. Um, we also worked with band fundraisers. We did bag decorating. Um, which is for a hygiene drive through Partners for World, he World Health. Um, we worked with concert band, a concert band festival through Ushering and at the PTA Carnival. So in addition to school-related events, uh, Interact Club partners with local organizations to do service events um, through places like Pixel Fund, which is where we help um, with dog adoption, uh, Partners for World Health, which I'll go into a little more later, which involves sorting and packaging medical supplies. Um, Scarber Community Services, we also uh, volunteer with the Ronald McDonald House, cooking meals for families who have children at Maine Medical Center. Um, we also do Christmas tree unloading and selling, and we've done various events through the Scarborough Land Trust, maintaining trails in the area, um, through Maine Veterans Homes, participating in events with um, veterans in Scarborough, um, as well as at the Scarborough Summer Fest, where we host a booth every year. Um, so a couple highlights about some of the events. Partners for World Health is one of our recurring events that goes on throughout the year. Um, at Partners for World Health, Interact members sort and box medical supplies for transport to countries in need. Um, in the past, we've sent supplies to places like Uganda and Senegal, um, Syria, and also um, many other countries, including um, other ones that are underprivileged or, need, or in need of medical supplies. Um, in addition to sending them internationally, um, Partners for World Health send supplies to local organizations, such as the Purple Street uh, Shelter. Um, and through this organization, even though it's based in Portland, um, I've been there a lot, and I think one of the great things about it is it allows members to have a global impact, um, even though they may not have the capacity to travel internationally. Um, and it really helps people appreciate the idea that you can have a positive influence beyond your local community. So we also participated in Christmas tree selling through the Rotary Club. Um, this was at Scarborough Sicko, and this was on Black Friday, the Friday right after Thanksgiving. Um, and this kind, kind of service included unloading trees from the big truck that you can see there in the picture, and we were also stocking the stands and organizing overflow. Um, also during this event, they sold Christmas tree throughout December, and we tagged trees, loaded trees onto cars, and we also made weeds for people. And for anyone who um, drives by the Scarborough Sick Go, it's the one on Route 1 by Oak Hill, so all of those Christmas trees there are ones that we have unloaded through Rotary. <laughs> um, another event that uh, Interact does throughout the year, or annually, is at Scarborough Summerfest, where um, we host a booth that has a balloon pop fundraiser. Um, it's the club's largest fundraiser of the year. 100% um, of the funds raised are donated. Um, and the idea is that people pay to participate in the game um, to compete for prizes sourced by donations from local businesses. Um, so in 2017, uh, the club raised $450 for Scarborough's Project Grace. Um, and this past Summerfest, we raised $500 for the Playing for Change Foundation, um, which aims to create a positive change throughout the world um, by starting music and arts programs in various countries. Um, another piece of Interact is the educational piece that in addition to community services, um, Interact members can uh, attend various conferences. Um, so as an example, in 2016, um, I went along with 10 or 11 other Interact members to Boston to listen in on a conference involving the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Um, this was through Rotary, um, and it basically educated people on the idea of disarmament internationally. Um, so this provided us with exposure to other ways that we can get involved with Interact. Um, and then recurring annually, there's the Interact Club Conference. Um, in 2017, it was hosted at Scarborough High School. And in 2018, um, I went to York 
along with some other members. Um, and the idea of the conference is to facilitate meaningful cross-club interactions that um, allow people to bounce ideas on each other from various schools and in turn better their own clubs. So Middle School Inter Interact Club is a branch of Rotary at the middle school and we meet on Thursday for 30 minutes after school. Um, it's run by myself and Sydney Kukas and it is with the help of Mr. Cronin. He offers his room and his services to help us run this successful club at the middle school. So some of the events that we take part in is we make Thanksgiving Day cards for the Veterans Home. We participate in book drives for the Little Free Libraries. We do crutches for Africa drives. Um, we've made blankets in the past and donate them to the Dempsey Center. We also take part in um, organizing and collecting food for the backpack program. And we've made Valentine's Day cards for letter, the Letters of Love organization. Uh, so just as a summary of Interact, we're a community service organization at the high school with about 20 to 25 regular members um, who participate in regular school and local service events. Um, we have a low hour requirement, which allows people to participate in projects that they genuinely enjoy, which makes for a more, more enjoyable atmosphere at the various events that we do. Um, we also do community service outreach for the middle school to help inspire younger students to become engaged and passionate about community service. Um, and in addition to people fulfilling community service hours, um, Interact Club also helps new students and students who have been at Scarborough for a number of years um, meet other students and also potentially develop leadership skills through the various officer positions that are in the club. say thank you for all the work that you did putting that presentation together. I loved hearing about what the club, I hear about the Interact Club a lot, but um, this gave me a lot of good information about what you guys do, and it's amazing. So mm -hmm. thank you all, mm -hmm. everyone who participates. Thank you. Absolutely, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of great work that you guys do, and it looks like you all get a lot out of it too, so mm -hmm. keep up the good work. Eric, what grade are you in? You're a senior. Have you, Kristen, have either of you um, gone to the Ryla Youth, the Ryla um, Rotary Youth Leadership Academy? I did not. Did you do that? <laughs> I've heard from students who have gone in the past that it's an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, Rotary has been trying to get more students to attend. Um, and then there's opportunities after you attend to come back as a counselor and things. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if you guys could help be, you know, kind of advocates in recruiting some. It's for sophomores only. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I know when I first heard students talk about it, I was my daughter was like three at the time, and I'm thinking, how do I make sure she gets to do that? Because it sounds like a really life-changing experience. If you guys needed help with that, I did Ryla uh, when I was at Scarborough, and then I participated uh, for 13 years as a director. So I'd be more than happy to help with the engagement in Scarborough and get that enrollment back up. Because when I went, there was 14 kids from Scarborough. Um, and I think yeah. it's gone down. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it has gone down a lot. And look how awesome Sarah is. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think the Rotary Club will sponsor like two to three students yeah. um, for that program. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And that's just one student group. Just <laughs> one of them. How many times? I have no idea. <laughs> Too many. And you're welcome to stay. You, you can't stay. Though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Six point one, the Scarborough Middle School STEM Talent Pipeline Grant. Yes, um, this is really exciting news to share. So this, um, this year, and I would ask uh, Mr. Daggle if you don't mind coming to the podium, I'm sure there might be some questions. Um, Mr. Daggle is one of our teachers at the middle school who recently earned a STEM talent pipeline grant. Um, and I, I won't try to summarize what it is, but I think I found a picture of what you want to do. Is that the right Lego robotics yes. thing? Okay, <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. So, could you tell us a little bit about um, why you wrote the grant and then what you hope it'll bring for our students at the middle school? Uh, well, I really am ex excited to uh, 
revitalize the middle school robotics program at the, at the middle school and uh, to try to get an after school club going again. Um, and we're going to use part of the pipeline grant to fund some of the equipment. The, the robotics are fairly expensive, so we're going to use that to go towards um, the cost of, of you know, setting that up and trying to incorporate uh, a robotics component as part of our technology and engineering curriculum at the middle school as well. Yeah, the, um, the other day, Pharma, if I'm saying, if that's how they say their little yes. acronym, acronym, came to the middle school to present the grant, and um, Senator Amy Volk was also there. And I think what I know since I've been here, there's been lots of conversations about how do we get a robotics program going, and we've been focusing on at the high school, and I think that this is a really um, great springboard to motivate you when you have the materials. It makes Absolutely. it easier, right? Yes. And you also put in for a Scarborough Education Foundation grant? Yes, I'm hopeful for to um, you know supplement the cost of that with the, the SEF grant as well. Mm -hmm. So that's still pending. No pressure, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> So do you know um, what the interest level is at the middle school at this time? Uh, I see a lot of interest with the kids just in technology and engineering. A lot of what we do in class involves the computer science and the coding, and, and there's just a very high interest in that, and, and really a high ability level too. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that the kids are able to put together, um, programming and coding online is, is really, really fantastic. And, I hope to provide them an opportunity to really take that coding that they do online and make it more physical and hands-on, um, so they can so they can you know make that transition to physical computing as well as you know just on their laptops. So, and and there's really a ton of things that you can do with the robotics equipment in all different aspects of coding and, and science curriculums and. Um, a lot, of, a lot of engineering challenges and, and things that, that are just strengthened by the equipment that we could get, you know, with that grant money. Awesome. And you're going to, did you say that you could integrate some of the equipment into your, um, into your regular classroom teaching plus the club? Right. Um, it, as far as the, there's a lot involved with, you know, the robotics curriculum and trying to make, like, we could have a whole class for a whole grade level just dealing with robotics. Um, so as a way to kind of get that started, we'd like to just um, take portions of that. Uh, I've already, with some of the outdated equipment that we had um, earlier in the year, I was able to have the kids in sixth grade do a project that um, incorporated making robotic arms that, that could throw uh, a two-inch ball. Um, oh, I remember that one. Yeah, so <laughs> in some ways we weren't able to, to do the entire, oh, I'm sorry, the entire robotics, um, you know, product and, and make full robots and, and have them to do the engineering challenges because it's, it's tough with, with 200 students that you have in the grade level that you're teaching it for the semester to make that work with the amount of, really, with the amount of equipment we would need to supply all of those. So we can use smaller portions of it throughout the classes to make, the, to make those work. And then for the students that are um, really inspired and motivated by that, they can take part in the after school curric extracurricular club to um, go even further with, with you know, the robotics skills that they would need. Thank you. That okay. sounds like it's going to be great for the Thank you very students. much for, for recognizing the program. Congratulations. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. The 7.0 might be one of my favorite topics. Spotlight recognition. Oh, before that, oh. I have one more recognition. Um, and I'm glad that Eric stayed because this is relevant to him. The high school main quiz <laughs> show is back um, this Saturday. Our students will be competing in Rockland, Maine against Ocean, Oceanside High, Ocean, is that right? Oceanside High School. Um, and Eric is one of the uh, team members along with Ian Youth, um, John Hayes, and Lena Wood last year, and then there's alternative students as well, Cooper Davis and Mary Jane Uzi. Last year, the team um, competed first against Cape Elizabeth, um, and no, first we competed against Wells and we won, and then we competed against Cape Elizabeth and we lost. And then Cape Elizabeth competed against Bangor, who ended up being the main champion. So I'm excited to see what you guys do this year. Um, I don't know, Eric, if you want to add anything to that. 
Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Studying hard, and you can watch. It is on the local access channel, so I, I believe I watched it last year, um, and so did my daughter. So thank you very much for being a part of that, and good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. Now I'm done. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, spotlight recognition. Okay, so this is so exciting. We have our second spotlight recognition award. Um, the board is very excited to present the second District Spotlight Award to Peggy Clements and Jim Marshall. Um, Peggy is the K-2 math instructional coach for the primary schools, and Jim is the 3-5 math instructional coach at Wentworth. Um, so these two teachers were nominated together by a colleague for the work they did to bring Dr. Yip Bonhar <laughs> to our district uh, to, prevent, to present professional development to our K-5 teachers. Um, Dr. Bonhar is one of the most accomplished trainers and speakers in the world on the subjects of K-5 mathematics and Singapore mathematics. And I was told that he's considered the Michael Jordan of math. <laughs> um, Patty and Jim planned the entire event, including a parent night, and secured funding for the professional development from the Scarborough Education Association. I mean, sorry, the Scarborough oh, Education you. Foundation. Um, this work he did with our teachers invigorated the math curriculum, and I've heard several teachers say that this was the best professional development they've attended. So thank you so much to Peggy and Jim. The board so appreciates the hard work that went into this, and congratulations to you both on your Spotlight Award. So. <laughs> did you, I was able to get this. Yes. Reference, so um, I'll do that first. So I just wanted to show everybody, um, this. these were two examples that I saw from um, some of the math work that is similar to what the tra what the training um, was teach was showing the teachers. Um, so if you can't read kid um, kid language as well as I can, I'll say I'll write it. I'll read it out loud. The first one um, is what strategy works best for you. Um, and the problem says there are ten muffins. Hector takes. I can't Hector takes some. Some three muffins are left. How many muffins does Hector? take. Um, so this student showed, um, that's called a number bond. If you have kids in K2, you probably know what they are. For a long time, I thought they were number bombs, <laughs> but they're actually bonds. Um, and, and this student, um, so these are both examples of journal, math journaling. Um, and so uh, it says, I like to count back. I put the whole, whole number in my head. I counted to the less number. Um, and then this student kind of said the same thing, um, right about, uh, so it's right about, and then the question is, what is four less than 10? Four less than 10 is six. Do you want to know how I did it? <laughs> I put four in my head and counted on until I got to 10. That's how I did it. And this student actually showed a number bond and uh, um, what are those called? A 10, ten, ten frame, and he, um, made some ducks and crossed them out. Um, so, so this is an example of how um, the kids, they were teaching about journaling and math and it kind of integrates some of the language arts things that they're learning about. Um, so I just thought that was cool and I wanted to show um, some of the stuff that, that they did at the recognition. So here's our two uh, award winners. I actually, I have a letter from Peggy's husband that <laughs> he asked me to read out loud. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read it out loud. For t like, just This is from him. Uh, Peggy, congratulations on your recognition as a winner for the Scarborough Spotlight Award. Your family and I are so proud of your accomplishments. You worked tirelessly, tirelessly to bring Dr. Yip Van Har to the district, secured a grant to do so, and spent countless hours preparing, facilitating, and successfully ensuring a hearty attendance for the event. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend tonight's event as I have previously scheduled occasion in Boston, Massachusetts. Peggy, you have been a beacon of light for me and our four children, their spouses, and your grandson. We cannot begin to express our gratitude. You are not only an integral part of our lives, a mother, grandmother, teacher, parent, pillar of community and church, but are also taking master's degree courses along with juggling full-time work and family responsibilities. Ooh. I'm exhausted just listen, <laughs> listing out all that you do. <laughs> we don't know how you do it so well. Sincerely though, please accept our loving appreciation and know that you well deserve this honor. We adore you, your loving husband, Mark. Um, so, oh, 
we also have, um, apparently it's, it's going to be our thing that we do a video, so we made another video. So what Jim and Peggy don't know is who nominated them. Yes, that's right. Okay. So this is the big reveal. <laughs> who nominated you for this award? It could be any number of 100 teachers who participated, right? I'm Peggy Wallace. I'm an academic support teacher at Eight Corners School. Peggy and Jim work tirelessly all of the time, but I think that their work toward bringing Bon Har to the district for K-5 teachers um, was over and above, beyond. I know they worked a lot during the summer to make this happen. Um, so. I thought they were worthy of this award. Hi, I'm Amanda Peabody. I'm a second grade teacher here at Eight Corners. Hi, I'm Susan Allen. I'm a first grade teacher here at Eight Corners. As it's my first year here at Scarborough, I felt like the Barnhart training was a great way to see um, Bonhar in action. He modeled for us how to do lessons, and it really inspired me and gave me things that I could bring back to my own classroom. And as this is my 25th year at Eight Corners, uh, seeing Bonhar really energized um, my math teaching and thinking about how to use math journals. Um, so as an English major with a little bit of math phobia still, he made that really, really approachable for me and for kids that don't always like math. Um, I think he gave us some great ideas about how to get them excited about problem solving. Just thank you for going out of your way to bring him and to inspire your teachers and really look out for us. Thanks a lot. I agree. Thanks for invigorating our instruction, getting our kids and families excited about math and problem solving. I'm Christina Albert. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Wentworth. And so we had the opportunity to go to professional de development, professional development with Dr. Yip, and it was really exciting to be there and hear what he had to say in person. So that in and of itself was great. Um, but what he was talking about really linked very well with the whole workshop model that we do for language arts, and this just brought the workshop model forward for me to mathematics. Thank you so much to Jim and Peggy for bringing this forward to us. I think that this opportunity was a great way for us to reinvigorate ourselves with our math program and to push ourselves to make kids more responsible for their own learning and help them become more independent and more creative in ways in which they think and approach problems. Jim and Peggy to come on up and Hillary has a few items for you and then the mic is open if you'd like to add any comments or thoughts. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I will say a few words. Um, obviously, 
the letter from my husband. I wouldn't be who I am without all of his support and my family's. Um, but for those of you that don't know about myself and Ban Ha, he is my math crush. <laughs> so it was an absolute pleasure to bring him here. It was a dream of mine. When we wrote the grant and we awarded the grant, I was over the moon, like <laughs> over the moon, like I'm gonna get to meet him in person. <laughs> um, and he was everything that we thought he was going to be. And, and this was just a few comments from the teachers, but boy, he just was dynamite. And the teachers had a ball, and um, Singapore math is, is alive and strong, and our kids are doing great. So thank you all very much. And I just want to say thank you again to the SEF for providing the grants, and uh, Joanne Sizemore, and uh, all the admin K2, and, and my admin 3-5, were, uh, and also my curriculum coordinator, uh, Monique Culbertson. They're all so helpful. They were just like, this is an awesome idea. We're going to make it happen. And I was just uh, thrilled with everybody's encouragement and response. It was like, how can we get this done instead of the obstacles? And there were obstacles. Lots. There were many obstacles. Yeah, many <laughs> but we overcame them. And, and Peggy really uh, carried the ball on this one. I was very happy to assist her. And uh, it was a real team effort. But Peggy, you did an awesome job of that. We did it together. But you know. And I believe that this grant was over twelve thousand dollars and the largest Scarborough Education Foundation grant that we've had to date, I believe. Yes, um, thirteen thousand. Thirteen thousand. Yeah. And um, just at Scarborough Ed Foundation did not ask me to do this, but they're also starting their annual giving campaign. Um, and so you can go to their website and, and donate. They have provided a ton of innovative opportunities. I think we're close to $200,000 in grants awarded to our teachers. And the idea is innovation grants. So these are things that we're not able to do within our, uh, within our um, budget, but it allows our teachers to to think outside of the box. And so we're so grateful. And for the teachers who write the grants, it's always more work when you write a grant. Um, but it really says a lot about how much you care about our kids in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to just take a quick break and let people leave if they want to? Sure. <laughs> you don't That's need to stay idea. for the whole meeting if you're <laughs> just here for the yep. recognition. We want you to be refreshed for tomorrow. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I have my grandson at home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, 8.0 superintendent's report, starting with 8.1 Scarborough High School grading and reporting analysis. Yes, yeah, so we're going to. Um, combine 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3 tonight um, as all of these topics are interconnected. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of having two of our high school teachers here, Michelle Shoup um, and David O'Connor, along with our principal, high school principal Susan Ketch and Monique Culbertson will be joining them as they talk about high school grading and reporting analysis that's currently ongoing at the high school. Um, we also will get a NEASC update, and then Monique will round it out with reminding us where we are with the current diploma laws in Maine. So with that, I turn it over to you, Principal Ketch. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for inviting us to do a little sharing and education on the high school's progress on NEASC this fall and on our grading and reporting. First thing I'd like to do is welcome all the new board members. Thank you for being here, and thank you for working so hard for our children in this district. We're really happy to have you here. Um, before we start this um, presentation, I just wanted to do some thank yous. I wanted to thank Michelle Shupp and um, Kathy Terrell and David O'Connor and Monique Culbertson, who worked on this diligently with me, and I just really want to thank them for all the work on this project. So just to kind of begin, um, as I took over the role of interim principal in the end of June, um, some of the summer thoughts and planning I, that kind of rolled through my head um, through the summer was that I wanted to start a wider conversation 
um, between the high school instructional leadership team this year and the um, central office staff. And um, so I, we started kind of formulating a plan for every third meeting, which is roughly every six weeks, to invite the superintendent, assistant superintendent, um, director of curriculum, um, Kathy has come as the instructional um, strategist, and um, also we've invited Allison as the um, special services director to have some conversations on a wider front and um, just be sharing some of our work and some of our good thinking um, with a larger audience. And um, so, and another thing that kind of was um, a question right away as I became the interim principal was that we hadn't um, heard from NIASC yet and we were kind of overdue at that point to hear. So one of the first things I sort of tackled was contacting NIASC and saying, what's going on? Have we, have we heard anything? And, and what I learned was they had sent a letter that looking high and low I couldn't find, but they sent us another one and, um, and so, um, that is, I've given you a copy of that. It's, it was at your um, desk today. And so the, the good news about that was we were accredited. And I know you've all heard that by now. But, but that was um, really an important thing. And um, so that sort of started us on um, working on some of these pieces. Um, so in, in a timeline, we got the letter and then um, on September 17th was our first full faculty meeting, and so I wanted to right away make sure that the faculty got the feedback on um, our accreditation and that report. So the letter you have is a, the letter that they got at the first full faculty meeting. And what we did that day was break um, the faculty into um, subgroups going back to our original self-study standard groups. And we recreated those as best we could. Um, of course, in the three years that had passed, we had had people leave and people come. So we, we kind of filled out those groups and got back in those standard committees. And um, what we did that day was Everybody had a chance to read through the letter, and we did some work to connect the commendations, the things that they wanted to point out to us that were, that, uh, were important, good things that were going on, and then also their recommendations. And the work the faculty did that day was to kind of look at those three areas of the letter and then pull things that aligned with the standard that they had worked on. So um, people could really see the, the work we did in preparation. Some of the, those things were addressed in the final report. So we did that work on the 17th. And then the next significant piece that happened was on October 3rd, we had our very first large group meeting with the ILT. And, um, and that was when... Um, Kathy met with us and helped us develop the high school building goals for the year, and we have two of those. So some of the work you're going to see um, in this, this progress report kind of links in all of those things. Now I'm going to turn it over to David to talk about the building goals. Before you move on, would you mind just for people that may not know what NEASC is, just explain sort of the the what that is and, and why that's important. I know you've summarized the accreditation, but, but the timeline for that and, and that sort of thing. So every 10 years, high schools get reaccredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, also known as NEASC, and um, they come and do a five-day visit with a school and look at many, many different aspects of the school. Two years prior to the school visit, um, the high school does what is called a critical self-study looking at seven standards and we kind of just do a self-assessment of ourselves. What are we doing really well with? What, what are areas we could um, grow? And then they come for five days and it's a team of educators from all over New England who come. Um, it's about, I think this time we had about 13 people that, visit, that came to visit and they look at student work, they meet with Everyone, they meet with students, they meet with staff, they meet with families, um, and they just do kind of a critical look at our school from a um, very neutral standpoint. And then eventually we get a report from them. And um, I, 
if you've lived in southern Maine for long, sometimes you will hear that a school didn't get accredited or uh, have been put um, kind of on a status that they have to do some serious steps quickly to get certified. And, um, and then following that, you have a two-year plan and a five-year plan and reports that have to go to NIAS kind of following up on some of their recommendations. So the good news is that we have been accredited for the next 10 years and um, we will do, be doing some work in follow-up as part of that 10-year cycle. Um, I know a lot of schools sometimes like to think that once that visit's over, it's like, whew, we got certified and we're good for a decade, but we're really not. We, it's kind of a constant cycle of improvement, looking at some of their re recommendations and um, working on those pieces as well. So we, we did get accredited, but now we'll have some more work to do for the two-year plan and the five-year plan. Does that help? That's very helpful. Thank you. So my name is David Connor. Um, so NIAS made a series of about 15 highlighted recommendations that we need to respond to either in the two-year report or the five-year report. So one of the things that we did when we started to think about building goals for 2018-19 was to try and incorporate some of the recommendations that they had made right into the building goals. So are we... Uh, Dave. Can I ask that you speak in the microphone so the folks at home can hear you as well? Please. Sure. <laughs> I guess everybody wants to hear me. Um, so I'll let you read through. I won't read the, the recommendation, but this was the, what, the sixth recommendation that we made at, or was made for us regarding the manner in which we present our curriculum. And so one of the things that we're going to do is try to get every department to write a curriculum in the format of essential questions, concepts, constant, content, skills, learning expectations, instructional strategies, assessment practices, and school-wide analytic group. So that, that's a lot of work. So we've put together a timeline. With this as the building goal. So this year we're going to try and develop a template. Michelle, uh, <laughs> back to the microphone. And then in 2020, essential questions, themes, learning targets will be added into that template. And then in 2021, try to finish with instructional strategies, assessment practices, and criteria for success. So hopefully by the end of 2021, we will have completed that process. And so here's our a more complete timeline, looking at specifically what we plan to do this year. Um, so apparently by the end of the year, we should be complete with the templates, the learning goals into those templates, and that should get us a good start toward moving to for the more important work next year. So a little bit on grading and reporting and how we got here. So as many people know, the high school has had um, a hybrid model for last year when we started this work with the freshmen and continuing this year. and um, and. So that was kind of started and recommended through the ILT team originally. And um, so when we had our first enlarged meeting with the central office coming to an ILT meeting early in September on the 19th, um, one of the things that came up in that discussion was that we didn't feel the hybrid model was working as well as we had hoped and planned. And so um, at that meeting, Dr. Kuchenberger gave us, really gave us a go ahead and said enthusiastically, if you do not think that is working the way you want, let's work on that. And so the team really took that to heart right away and decided to, to work on that. And so I, just so people understand the process 
that we're, we're using and we've developed incorporates the DataWise process. And as you may know, we had a core of four educators at Scarborough High School go to a DataWise um, conference at Harvard last, well, in January of this year. And so we've incorporated a lot of our work in the district using that DataWise system. And so this sort of process has kind of embraced that DataWise system. Also, um, the middle school did some great work throughout the spring um, to work on their grading system. And we um, heard, heard and knew that that was a lot of good work. And um, Diane um, and Kathy Terrell have both helped give us a lot of the resources that they used. And we have kind of reformulated them for the high school process. But that's another place that we got them. And then, as David mentioned, we did incorporate some of the NEASC recommendations into this work as well, because they are recommendations, and um, we thought there were some real natural connections there. Um, my name is Michelle Shook. I'm a Latin teacher at the high school. I'm also the curricular instructional coach. I also want to thank you for <laughs> letting me be here, because I have three young kids, and I don't usually get to stay out this late, so <laughs> it's kind of fun. So. <laughs> um, so the second bullet point in the recommendations from NEASC was to ensure greater involvement by all stakeholder groups, maybe sounds familiar, particularly parents and students, in the review and revision of the school's core values, beliefs, and 21st century learning expectations. We felt this was really critical for Scarborough at this point in our, in our coalition to work together to help students. So we aligned this with that, we, we said we need to take a look at our grading and reporting system. What's happening right now, it was developed based around really good thinking and all of our best intentions, but it's just not really working. And so we wanted to ask the critical people involved, parents, students, and faculty, we need to hear from you. We need to hear what's working for you and what's not working for you. So our goal, our second building goal, is that by June of 2019, the high school will complete an improvement cycle in the focus area of grading and reporting. And that will be reflecting um, input from our parents, input from our students, and input from our faculty. And in working in those big group meetings at our instructional leadership team with our central office as well. So we've started this work um, as, as soon as we sat down and said, okay, after that October meeting with Kathy and with Monique and uh, with our central office, um, we said, okay, so we need to get feedback from our community. So we created some surveys. The ILT took a look at the surveys to make sure that we felt they really reflected what what we needed to hear from people. Um, the most important part of the survey was the question at the end, what have we missed? <laughs> you tell us if we didn't ask the right questions. Um, we discussed with Monique, uh, what are the parameters of this work, our curriculum director? Um, what are the things that we need to make sure we're meeting, to make sure to meet Maine law? And also to um, meet our student-centered, um, you know, that we need to stay centered on the students. Um, we completed the survey data, data, created data overviews, involved Ted Hall from uh, Greater, uh, Greater Schools Partnerships. And then the critical pieces that have happened recently is after hearing back from our students, after hearing back from our parents, and after hearing back from our faculty, we split into teams of focus groups to reflect on that data as a high school faculty. So a third of our faculty reflected and read and reflected on the parent data. A third of our faculty reflected and read uh, the student data. And then a third of our faculty reflected upon after reading the faculty data. And what we came <laughs> up with were some pretty clear common threads. <laughs> there were some red threads that ran through the whole thing. And so we brought that information that those teams at that, uh, at the, at that meeting, which was just Monday, feels like a long time ago, but it was just Monday, um, we came up with some common themes. At the ILT meeting yesterday, uh, we discussed those. And now we're moving forward on December 19th. We're going to be discussing some of those common themes that we saw throughout and some of the decisions that we'd like to move forward with, some of the recommendations we'd like to make as we progress and grow and go through an improvement cycle with our grading reporting, hearing from our stakeholder groups. Um, and then as we work through that, we'll have focus groups in this uh, coming month to really work specifically with our incredible ninth and 10th grade teachers, teachers like Krista Rosa, who's here, um, who is revolutionizing math, and um, really look at and ask them, so how does this work? These are the themes we're seeing. 
what is your specific feedback having taught in this system for six quarters? What are we, what are we missing? Are we missing anything? What do we need to hear? Um, and then moving forward, Sue will communicate those with our larger community. Again, open up space for feedback from parents, students, and teachers so that we can make sure we're really honoring that NEAS recommendation, which is hearing from people in a way that is value added to our development process. So one of the pieces um, that's really important to me is I know that the last two summers, our staff at the high school has been really um, driving hard to be ready for these grading changes. Um, two years ago, it was to be ready for the core areas for the ninth graders, those teachers to be ready to work in the hybrid system. Last summer, we were adding the 10th grade teachers, and we really had hard pushes on to have everyone ready. Our hope this year is that um, we will be able to spend second semester getting ready, doing the staff development, getting things aligned, and that as school is ending in June, we're going to be in a position that we're more ready for the fall and not have to have such a summer push. So that's just one of um, the goals we've set for ourselves is to really use that gift of second semester to do the work we need to do to be ready. I, I feel like we've because we've been in this process for nearly a year and a half, we're going to have a good handle on where we're at and what we need to tweak. And the second semester will give us the time to do that good work and really be ready um, to blossom the program and really have it where we want it um, for the fall. Um, in terms of the NEASC follow-up, um, at the October meeting, um, we decided that the ILT team itself would be the NEASC follow-up committee. That is um, designed in the NEASC system that you, you create a committee for that. And the reason that we really opted for that is that our ILT really has a great um, blend of every department and representation at the table and so we really thought that was a great team to be doing this work and um, so throughout this year the ILT team will be looking at each of those recommendations um, it's on page three of your letter and we've sort of already touched on um, bullet two and bullet six in the, um, you saw those two quotes and um, we will be working on a plan of action if not, we don't have to have completed everything by the two-year report, but we should have a plan for everything, and we will be doing that work throughout the year. And in October, um, the principal submits a two-year progress report because by October it will already have been two years since they visited. Um, so that'll be um, some of the next steps coming up with NEAS, just so you kind of know where we'll be going with that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an update on where LD 1666 is in relation to the new graduation or requirements from the state. But first, I'd just like to articulate the difference between sort of the grading and reporting practices because they are somewhat separate from each other. Grading practices at the high school involve giving effective feedback to students against the standards and learning goals within each of the core courses. And so some of that, those assessments or what we refer to as evidence are formative where students are getting feedback on practice homework types of things that give them some information to help them continue to grow and learn that content then there's the summative evidence and the summative evidence typically goes into the reporting piece that would be that would be like um, your final course grade so the reporting practices we're also going to be looking at as well in terms of what should a report card look like and what should transcripts look like as well. And that's a tall order for both report cards and transcripts because they not only need to speak to students, parents, teachers, but also um, higher education and businesses as well. So we're really looking at that as a way to better market our students moving forward post Scarborough High School. Um, in terms of the diploma law, in July of this year, uh, LD 1666 was adopted, signed by the governor. And what that essentially does is it makes the proficiency-based diploma law, which gave us a very tight time timeline to comply, made that optional. But it also provided or left open another option, which is a credit-based diploma with some minimum expectations. 
When LD 1666 was signed into law, it also amended about 21 other statutes as well. So it's taken some time to figure out all of those in terms of the impact. The DOE provided some clarification, which I shared with uh, the board the other day. Um, I'm trying to stay connected to my professional organization to keep an ear in terms of what's going on in Augusta. Um, the legislature is in session. Um, there will most likely be some new bills in the pipeline in and around high school graduation. I do know that DOE has been involved in some discussions recently where they're having conversations about the role of the guiding principles as a college and career readiness element. Uh, so there will be, I expect that there will be some changes, but because this is Maine, it's kind of a wait and see. I think that as long as we look at both of those options and take a look at what's going to work best for Scarborough, we will need to do something. I would recommend that we do something in and around the guiding principles, which is not at present in the credit option. Um, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. Uh, grading and reporting practices, as we look at those pieces, as they fold into this um, graduation diploma piece, it's really about, that connection is really about progress in meeting those graduation requirements. So the high school is free to make whatever improvements they deem fit that are going to work for Scarborough and Scarborough community. We just want to make sure that those practices also provide the information and fold in line with the graduation um, requirements that will um, that this board has set. Questions? I have a question. Um, <clears throat> you had mentioned you did surveys for the parents, teachers, students. What was your response rate to those? Do you know? Um, <laughs> we had about 500 responses from students. Um, Parent uh, staff, we were at about three quarters, um, but some some of our teachers that are under the teacher contract really don't do curriculum delivery and assessment. For example, social workers are under a teacher's contract, so not all of them felt um, qualified right. to to give feedback on something they don't do. Um, but we had pretty much a hundred percent response from the faculty and parents. About 200, I think, it we were in that neighborhood. 173. Of okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. No questions. And about 478 students. 480. You, you mentioned that Monday you guys met and you had three groups and each group took either the student, the parents, or the teacher feedback on the survey data. Um, and um, Michelle, you talked about some uh, very um, significant themes. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you guys are ready to share some of those themes with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> she beat me to it. We did. Um, there's great enthusiasm for the 0 to 100 grading. Um, there was a, a strong theme throughout that um, the hybrid grading could go away. Um, so those were some initial, initial things. And that was that all came. three groups? Yes. Okay. That's pretty universal. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, first of all, I, I just would like to acknowledge the amount of work that has gone um, on in the middle school and in the high school to get us to this point. And so thank you all for, for that. It's um, really encouraging to see and, and to know that the teachers are a part of the development of that. And so thank you. Thank you for that. One of the concerns that I have in trying to um, figure out how to move forward is that it seems like there's still a disconnect between the board and the school and, and how we're moving forward and setting those goals and we need to ultimately make some important decisions and I was wondering particularly if the if the um, teacher representatives have any suggestions on how we can get that information um, while you're while you're developing it and and we can sort of tack in it tackle into that so that we're not on um, operating on separate spheres spheres do you know what i'm saying yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, i'm not really sure I, maybe we could share our our notes with you I, i'm really not sure what the appropriate avenue would be but it's I, certainly not I don't. I don't mean to imply that at all. But I mean, when we're when we're working, that's all information that we want to hear from you. And and 
personally, I'd love to have it delivered from from those people that are doing the work. I know. Oh, sorry. Do new members have access to Discovery Team Drive? Um, I'm just curious. To, yeah, well, we're in the process of developing a team drive for the board specifically, but they don't have access to all of the team drives across the district. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we can certainly, I, I think that the ILT could certainly provide their notes and that, that information to the board on a periodic basis. I, I, I don't know. Very detailed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think I, well, the and one make recommendations to the board. Mm -hmm. Certainly. That the the one way that we have, or there are several ways that we have done that in the past. So presentations like this is one way. Mm -hmm. School board workshops is another way when we're um, wanting more of a discussion and a dialogue around that around various educational topics. Um, bo board members do sit on a variety of committees as well. Um, and um, the, I believe that policy development is best done when the recommendations come from the educational experts that are in the field. And so what we ha have done in the past for our um, current diploma, really diploma policy, or graduation policy rather, came from the ILT. Mm -hmm. So that work, they make the recommendation, then either the principal and or teachers or both come to a policy meeting with their recommendations to the board. Um, and that's been a really healthy process in terms of policy development. And then once that the, the recommendations come from the teachers, the, the educators or the nurses, if it's a nurse, you know, if it's a medical related policy, um, or the athletic director, if it's an athletic related policy, we always try to you know, get the recommendations from the ground up through um, to the board. Then we run it by our um, school district attorneys to say, is there anything we're missing here? Are, there, are we making the right legal connections? And in that process, the board typically gets a variety of sample policies from MSMA, from Drummond and Woodsum, and from other school districts. And they use that too to think about what language fits for us and aligns to our mission and our vision. That's how th that process has So happened. I agree with you, and, and, and I value their expertise. I mean, that's not my expertise. I guess my concern is that it seems like that information goes through multiple filters a along the way up until we, re we receive that information. And so that I, dialogue seems to be missing to me. Well, can I just kind of piggyback on that a little bit? And, and I, I agree, too. I mean, I, I, I want our policy about about curriculum and instruction and diplomas to be um, based on what our educators think is what's best for students. That's my, that's my number one priority. Um, I'm, I'm hearing you guys say that there's a very <laughs> strong theme that you want zero to 100. And, and I'll go on record right now and say, I can get behind that. <laughs> but we as a board need to, to do that work to, so that we can support what you guys are doing in, um, the, you know, the work you're doing for the next, gosh, um, this year and next year, it's a lot of work. I mean, David said it. <laughs> what you guys have in front of you is a ton of work. Um, but if we as a board can make a decision about whether or not this is going to be a credit-based district um, early while you're doing that work, I feel like that would give you guys a sense of relief and some guidance so you can move forward and do that intense work that you need to do within all your classes at all levels. So, I mean, I, I would love to have a workshop where we can kind of hear from you guys again, maybe get some more teachers um, down here to kind of talk about that work and then get the information a, we need. So just to piggyback again on that, like, do you, do you feel that not knowing what the graduation requirements are going to be is impeding your work? Not at this stage. I think we're just going to do what we think is best okay. for students, and then if that doesn't meet what the state wants, then we'll have to adjust. But mm -hmm. I'd much okay. prefer to, to develop something that everyone at the high school is comfortable with. I agree. Mm -hmm. and, and then okay. see what we have to do. Well, and just like for Amy and Elizabeth, I think this, having you guys come and just give us an update on what the process mm -hmm. is, is maybe a really good step in the right direction because I didn't know any of this. I mean, I know some of it, but I didn't know the majority of this work was going on and I really liked hearing about it and the process mm -hmm. that you're using. The decision-making process has been in place. I, I'm, I'm hoping that this is my third year. I don't know how long it went back. Um, the decision-making decision process is in place with ideas um, coming through the ILT, through the departments to teachers and then te uh, teachers discussing those things with department chairs bringing them back to the ILT 
now makes the recommendations is very fluid and it really allows um, what it really allows for a lot of teacher voice um, because the, the teachers know what's going on. You know, the teachers know what's working and what's not working. And when our teachers, um, you know, having worked in, in other districts, um, when our teachers at Scarborough are telling us this is not working, it's not working. Because it's not that our teacher our teachers are world class. Mm -hmm. um, I it is I couldn't I could not more highly um, advocate for the professionalism and efficacy and you know flexibility, particularly of our ninth grade core course teachers. Um, I don't have enough words, and I'm a word person. So um, <laughs> we are, I, I'm really glad that we are taking the time to reflect on this. And it's something that you know we just have developed a hybrid system because we didn't just want to jump our kids to one to four because that just had too many questions for viability to go on to high school. So we wanted something that spoke to the new PDE system, but at the same time still spoke to our parents of students whose primary language was zero to one hundred. Mm -hmm. So I'm a foreign language teacher. So I felt like with zero to one hundred, everybody can understand that, right? So the hybrid system at the time was our best thing. In response to the changes in our own district, because we wanted also to speak to the middle school, which was at the time our one to four, mm -hmm. right? But as a reflection of the, the changes within our own district and of course within the state, we're able to rethink that and say, okay, what is really best for our students? And so I'm really excited about this process that we're going through. And we are absolutely uh, happy to be as you know, flexible and open to discussion with we can certainly make sure that it, the letters and correspondence that are going out to um, parents and students and faculty can you can all get copies of that so you'll get those updates as well that's easily done Alicia could we have copies of the the slideshow too just so we can sort of see the work that you're doing in the timeline for a price <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely thank you. thank you I think you may have mentioned this but I actually um, was wondering how much how closely are you working with the middle school to, um, I mean, I get that you're doing what's right for the high school, but um, to how closely are you working with the middle school to create some continuity for those kids who are going from that up to the high school? Well, keep in mind, um, Kathy has been a great link because she did the entire middle school process at the middle school, and, and she's also working with us. So we've got that good natural connection right there. Um, so I think we're going to be very well linked together. And then, of course, nobody knows the district's curriculum and plan, right? <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not joking. That's it's true. true. <laughs> like, nobody knows the vertical articulation of this district. Like, cold, cold. I have another question. I don't know who to ask it of, but um, what is the current policy for repeating work to improve grades? That would vary from, from teacher to teacher and department and department and, and um, it, it's fairly similar course to course if there are multiple teachers teaching, but it is not um, absolutely the same that throughout was, the building. I'm so sorry. That was one of the red threads. One of the what? One of the red threads that ran throughout. Okay. That is something we need to look at and discuss and set, a, set some best practices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, What's the policy currently? I've heard sort of changing ideas about this over um, the past year or so about work that's not handed in and grading that work. Again, at this point, that's a teacher decision. Okay. So it varies by teacher. Um, and as Michelle said, I think there's some great value in trying to get some best practices. So the 60 requirement is not there anymore? No. Okay. And, and we did talk about that um, some of our work in this process second semester is going to surround best practices for things. And it may look different from one subject to the next just by the nature of the learning in those departments. But that, that was something that came out at the ILT meeting yesterday is that we really want to be working on some best practices around this. Okay. I guess I would add that, because uh, this is true, that if the students are not proficient in a learning goal, they're always allowed to, to work on that learning goal, even though the, a final summative may have been given and the student did not show proficiency. They're always allowed to work on their proficiency. That
that may or may not change the course grade. Also, too, so that's the, the piece is that you can remediate a learning goal, but how that affects the course grade is dependent upon the teacher. Okay. I'm so sorry, I just like interrupted the music here. <laughs> <laughs> So there, we have these different ideas that we, you know, these are things that we anticipated would arise but when they arose. We were like, here it is. What are we doing? Here it is. <laughs> so we, um, those are those are the conversations again that we need to develop some best practices around. Which is one of the reasons it's doing all this survey work and hearing from our um, stakeholders prior to December is critical because then we can have some givens that we can really take the time we need to develop best practices, make sure we're on point with our stakeholders, and have the PD done in time so that our, our faculty isn't working all summer like they have in the last two years. So I think, I think the surveys have served as great validation mm -hmm. for what we were feeling and thinking, but it, it's just been really nice to have a broad sweep of all the stakeholders saying, yep, we agree. So I think it's just going to help us feel more confident in that our work is headed in a very good direction. So I think that's been a really important piece for us. So I think that you said this, and I just want to make sure for my own clarification, the bulk of this work is being done now is as your professional development time. So with the faculty, with the staff, or is this just the LT, ILT? Well, for example... The faculty okay. survey was done during our November faculty meeting. We gave them time to get that done so that they didn't have to find other time to try to get on that. Okay. Um, so this work is happening at opportune moments. Like some, of, some of it may happen. in um, This year our PLTs can change in January. So there may be groups that as we work on this grading and reporting work feel like we'd like to spend some PLT time developing that in our department. Or So there will be some opportunities there. But um, to date, a lot of the work that's been done has been either in ILT meetings or at faculty meetings. We've been using that time to, to get some of these pieces done. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. No problem. I only have two more. Um, <laughs> My, da my daughter it, it currently has, um, on power schools, how I receive her grades. She gets a zero to 100 grade, and then she gets a one to four grade. How is that being reported on the transcript currently, and what's the plan if there's a change? Transcript is strictly zero to 100 right now. Okay. Because most transcripts are in play for seniors. That's when they need those transcripts and they are not in the hybrid system. Okay, thank you. And then the, my last question is, is the NEOSC report, um, has that been made public or? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. thank you. I believe we sent a copy to the town library as well. Mm. So they should have a copy. Is it on the website? Is that where it is on the school website? Is it out there yet? I didn't see it today. But I We're working on that. Okay, yep. thank you. I want to thank the high school for um, inviting central office to your ILT meeting and because I found it very valuable and also all the work that you have done um, and working together collaboratively. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for having us tonight. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Great job, guys. All right. 8.4, donations from tickets. Yes. Um, and David and Michelle, please feel free if you'd like to go. <laughs> Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank we you. Really appreciate your time. Um, so, yes, this actually requires a motion from the board because of the large amount of the donation. Um, so I will ask for a motion to... Um, I will, I will recommend to the board that you make a motion to approve this donation. We received a very uh, generous donation of $2,500 from Heather and Brian Paquette for the backpack program. And so as you know, our backpack program helps support our families who have food insecurity on long weekends, in the summer, over holidays. Um, and even um, we have started to um, 
our food service department has started to share meals with families during the week as well that we know are in need. And so this donation is huge and is greatly appreciated. Um, and because Mr. Paquette is a Unum employee, we will also receive a matching grant donation from Unum. So um, the, I would recommend that the board make a motion to uh, both thank the Paquettes for their generosity and also accept the $2,500 donation. Okay. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I just have a quick question, actually. What's the annual cost for the backpack program? Like, we get, I know we get a bunch of donations annually, but like, what's the overall cost? Um, it's kind of hard to quantify because it changes, you know, holiday to holiday, week to week, and we do get so many donations from a variety of folks. I know employees contribute. Some people bring actual food. Other people make cash donations. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to know if you have an idea of how we could quantify that, Dylan. <laughs> the okay. other thing I would add, just um, <laughs> again, is that or to this is this is the fifth large donation that the Paquettes have made in the last five years. Wow. So I forgot to say that. Wow. I'll just say thank you. That's so generous. Um, and it's amazing that it's being matched too. So yes. that's going to be really, really great for our backpack program. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. There's not enough good things to say for the generosity of the family. Any other discussion? Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? He's seven and two? Six. Six, sorry. Six. <laughs> I'm imagining that you're <laughs> He's here in spirit. Exactly. Mm -mm. No, he's not. He's on a beach. <laughs> <laughs> and I am so jealous. <laughs> Call him out. Great. Um, 8.5 enrollment update. Yes, so as um, per usual, our first business meeting, I always like to give the board an update and where we are with our enrollment numbers. We are also coming in very close to finalizing our enrollment study update. Um, so hope to have that for you either at the next meeting or in early January. Um, as you can see here, I'm also giving you the comparisons of our existing projections. Um, that study was completed in January 2016. Um, and we did two different models. The best fit model, which is what was co is commonly used across the state, uh, looks at census data and um, housing mix and things like that. And then because of the growth that was happening in Scarborough then um, and now, we're using, uh, we also have what's called a new housing projection. And for us, that has been really much more accurate um, than the best fit model, so much so that when the Department of Ed came um, to do our facility visits, when we were trying to get on the funding list for some facility uh, updates, they um, made a special, uh, a, a special uh, ob waiver, I guess, to use the new housing numbers, even though typically they don't because they were so much more accurate. And we started realizing that our numbers weren't as accurate. We were pretty much like plus or minus one or two kids each month um, as we would look at those projections. And at the end of this year, we're starting to see um, some convergence where it's not quite as accurate. And that's why we've asked to um, update the study. And Rebecca Wandell, who is currently an employee at Scarborough, is working as a consultant um, to do this work for us because she, before working with us, worked with um, planning decisions, which was the company that did the original study. She was actually the researcher who did that. Um, so very fortunate for us that we still have access to her. And um, she uh, is, a, is going to be coming to present with you um, very soon, kind of what she's learning. And she's looking at all of the existing building, but all that's in the pipeline as well. So she's been working really closely with Jay Chase in our um, planning department here in town. So I won't read the numbers to you, but um, you can see there where we are. And last month when I reported, we had four fewer students. So our population's growing a little bit this month. Julie, generally, what's the trend across the year? Like, do you expect it to go up and down? Like, what's the past trend in enrollment? I think so, the beginning of the year was 29.17. And we were. So it, we were at 2,917 in the beginning of the year. What we typically see is that in the winter months it goes up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's because of winter rentals or things like that. Um, the principals would probably know more kind of what students are coming to them. And then at the end of the year, we see it kind of drop a little bit, but not as significantly as this. I mean, to have 42, 32 more students since August is, is pretty significant. Um, and uh, for all of the new board members and the public, if you go onto the, our district webpage and you go to the superintendent's page, um, 
it's linked right here, but I don't think I can access it from here, Kel. Um, if you go right to that page, I'll pop and go over. Uh, I, there's a multi-year analysis there, so if you really like to look at the data, like we do, um, you can note, look at that. And it also shows you the projections across um, all the way out till 2025. So um, that's not what I wanted to show you. I'll just show you real quick since I'm talking about it, how to get there. Come to our website, um, you find superintendent right here under central office. I'm over in the black bar there on the side. And then you do have to scroll down to the bottom, but there's um, past, present, and projected enrollments. So this is what we complete at the first of every month, but you can see we have multiple years here. Um, this is the first year that we started capturing that August data. And then um, this end of year actual, at the end of the school year, that's the number that I plug in here for this June date. And then the light blue is the, um, new is the new housing, and the dark blue is best fit. So you can go in and look at that and see kind of how we're projected to shift. Moving forward, we see our enrollment has gone down over the last couple of years, but the important thing to notice is what's happening at each of the phase levels. So even though we might have fewer students as a district, we have more students at the primary levels right now. So it's, it's a fun thing to watch and, and uh, study. Okay. So the next thing in my report is just to give you a little update on where we are with the Regional Service Center. So as you know, um, this past election in November, there was a local question number one, different than the statewide question number one. Uh, the local question was asking our voters to approve our participation in, in a regional service center. And this is something that the board had voted on in the spring, um, back in May. They uh, looked at the interlocal agreement and, um, and voted unanimously to join the regional service center. And what the that what the state has done is they've taken monies out of system administration and they've created this incentivized um, regional service center option. And so some people would think it's a penalty, but they don't. They, the state calls it an incentive. Uh, the important thing to know, though, is that there's no additional money added to the formula. It's just kind of how it's getting allocated. And so in order to receive those monies, you have to have had your voters agree to become a part of a regional service center. And so here in Scarborough, um, that failed by a very small margin, a um, couple hundred votes. And I think partly, you know, I don't, I obviously don't know exactly what happened, but as I hear in conversations, I think there was some confusion between the local question one and the state question one. I heard other folks were thinking like regional service unit back when the districts were consolidated, so that had some people saying, no, thank you. Um, and others had just, I, I think, just were not sure what it was. Um, so what we, the, the question has been, and, and Larry asked earlier, um, one of our community members at, during public comment, what's the impact? Well, the immediate impact, like literally before the vote was certified, was that we got a letter from the Department of Ed that said that $40,000 that we thought we were getting because we said we were going to participate would be taken away. And so our ED 279, which is the you know, spreadsheet that tells us what our allocation is, was adjusted immediately. So to quantify for folks, $40,000 is a, a beginning teacher salary. Um, so that's a teaching position um, without benefits, but um, still it's a significant portion. And this is significant for us particularly because we're minimum receivers. And so if that money was just in the system, in, system admin line, which is like, think of it like inside the formula and outside the formula, if it was inside, um, we would still be scheduled to receive less than the minimum, so they would still have to use 40% of our special education to determine how much money Scarborough would be receiving in terms of state funding or, or general purpose aid. For us, because we're minimum receivers, it really is an added um, bonus, if you will, it really is an added incentive for us because it would have gotten lost inside the formula, where here it literally is in its own table on its own page toward the back of the ED-279, here's your $40,000. Next year, it will double. It'll be over $80,000. Um, so of course, right away, our questions were, what can we do about this? 
Um, we think that we could communicate better and engage our community better and get a different um, get a different response from our community. So, the first thing that I had to ask um, Chair Casleonis for was permission to put our name on the potential partner list. Um, and so I did that, and we're, so we're on the list, and what that means is that when our ED-279 comes to us in the next couple of weeks or month or so, um, it will show very clearly what that amount is, and it, and it will, it's scheduled to be about $80,000. That's two teachers, two teaching positions. Um, so something we greatly need, and it really is an added incentive for us because, like I said, if it was just in the system admin line as it had been that money, it would get lost in the formula, or it would, you know, it, it wouldn't be um, such a, a positive impact for us. So um, we signed the potential partner list. The DOE has it, and they know that we're in. Um, our goal is during the month of December to really educate the board so that you have a deep understanding and you can become ambassadors of this message. I know um, one thing folks were asking us right before the vote was, do you guys support this? And so um, we thought we had made that clear, but know now that we can do that better and we plan to do that. Um, and then what we'll have to do is, um, after we get really clear about our understanding, then we will go to the town council and ask if they can put it on the next referendum um, in June, so that when folks come to vote for the budget, they'll also have a chance to vote on the Regional Service Center again, assuming the Town Council gives us um, the okay to do that. So we, we have an opportunity. It's not lost and gone forever. And just one little um, example of the value of being a partner, and um, next next meeting, Mick Roy is gonna come and give you a presentation. He's gonna share the history. We've been, uh, we've been regionalizing, if you will, and sharing services across the region for- 15 years. 15 years um, or more. And mm -hmm. so a lot of what we were doing here was just formalizing what we already do, but it also motivated us to start thinking about what else could we share and the opportunity of filling out the application. And so we look to share in two, you have to be in two different service centers. So food co-op, which we currently do, and we will continue to do because we've always done that. Um, and that allows us to get better pricing on materials from the three vendors that we all share. Um, and then also professional development, which we already do. Joanne and Monique have done a great job of sharing services. So when we bring folks out for like eye observation training, we invite other districts to come and they pay to participate in that and it lowers the cost to our district. This past week, we had 80 people here in these two rooms. Um, we hosted, and the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, which is our people that we wanna join and be a part of in the Regional Service Center, hosted a um, professional development. They're actually doing a series of three sessions. Friday was the first one. I know Diane was there. I don't know if Cal did you, Brem got to go. Um, they're, they're studying the book, Crucial Conversations. Uh, it's really how do you have those difficult conversations, which we, in our jobs, do every day. Um, and we had 13 folks who attended. It cost us $75 per attendee for them to participate in this, and then of course we bought the book for them as well. So that's $975. And that's what it'll cost for them to attend all three sessions, plus they're getting to network with um, 70 other colleagues from other districts and get ideas. And, and if we were to host that ourselves, it probably would cost us about $3,000, depending on the consultant. They all have different fees, but it, easily $3,000. So already massive savings, right, just by sharing that service. The other part of it is that everyone who attended paid $75. So times that by 80, that's $6,000. Um, the additional monies after paying the consultant goes back into the regional service center um, budget. So that allows us as a regional service center to say, what else can we bring for our teachers and our leaders um, to better provide education that's current and um, evidence-based so our students can achieve more and be even smarter. So that's just a very real example of how important it is um, to continue this work. And we, one of the things we said in the very beginning as a regional service center, all the superintendents and assistant superintendents at, who were crafting this said, let's do what makes sense. You know, let's make sure that any decisions that we're making are sustainable and we're not creating some new thing just so that we can meet the requirements of the application process, but that we're doing something that we know is going to have an immediate return on our investment. 
And I think that's important also for the community to know. So do you all have a copy of the interlocal agreement? So this is um, the legal document that was crafted with um, uh, attorneys that we used as a, uh, the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. Again, this has already been approved by um, our board back in May, but I wanted you to have it so that you can understand deeply what we're committing to, but also what happens um, if we want to break away. Uh, that was some of the challenges with the regional service units when they consolidated the school district. There's some districts still who wish they could break away, and there's lots of legal um, challenges. So we learned from that, and we crafted this agreement so that everyone could be clear, all of our boards and our communities could be clear that we're thinking smartly about this. And um, I give this to you today so that you have time to read it before Mick comes um, on the 20th. And Mick Roy is the executive director of the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, so I wanted you to be able to have firsthand um, interaction with him. So with that, any questions about that? I just want to say I'm really happy that we have another opportunity to get this right. <laughs> Um, I was really disappointed when it didn't pass. I tried to talk it up all fall, um, and so I, it was a bummer. And, yeah. and we could probably debate all kinds of reasons why it might have, but I'm glad we can try again. Yeah. Um, I, just, I also wonder if um, it's an opportunity to kind of sell this is starting really soon when we start going out in the community and talking about the budget. Yeah. So I'm thinking if, if we can get the town council to, to agree to put it on the ballot in June, we can start talking this up and educating the community as early as January and continue having that conversation through the vote. I think that might go a long way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a great strategy. Any other questions? For is, is this something that commu the communication committee is working on, sort of education and getting that information out to the public? Yeah. It will. Yeah. Okay. We created a Q&A um, that had like, kind of the common questions that we've all been hearing in our different communities um, and compiled that and then just customized it to be Scarborough specific. And I just don't think we got it out soon enough in, in a wide enough way. So that document is at the ready um, and we can begin sharing that in a lot of different ways as well. Thank you, Kai. Thank you. Okay, 8.7, suggested timeline for workshops and presentation topics. Yes, so um, the central office leadership team um, and I had do this regularly. We always map out sort of what are the crucial conversations that the board needs to have, what are the presentations that we give on an annual basis. We sort of have like a common schedule. Um, and then what are the presentations like tonight that you want to have from staff or, or that we feel you, you would benefit from having from staff. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've tried to differentiate what's going to be a workshop, what's going to be a presentation, um, and then what are some of the critical actions that we know the board has to take at certain times of the year. Um, and so we mapped this out using post-its and stickies. And if you've you, up in our conference room, you see it's been hanging on the wall. Um, and then I took some time over the past week in an effort to just kind of give you guys a little bit of structure and so you can see what the plan is because I know there's you're eager and you want to learn a lot about the district and you want to know when and how decisions will be made. Um, so we mapped it out for you and this is totally a living, breathing document. Just what we think is um, a good path forward and the idea is that it's flexible. We can move things around. We do this in our own leadership meetings. We're constantly cutting and pasting and saying, oh, next month, oh, next week, instead of, you know, as different things pop up. And so we hope that this could be a tool that works the same way for the board. Um, I printed it just so you can look at it right now and ask any questions, but it's really best meant to be a digital document. So I, can, I will share all of that with you. Um, and just walking through, we're in December, so this is actively happening right now. You'll see in the first column you have your workshops, and in the second column you have presentations. And the way we've differentiated this is workshops are those meetings that you're having in public where you're actually grappling with concepts or you're learning new knowledge and skills and um, trying it out, whether it's through case study or scenarios or things like that. And then presentations are more we're going to give you information, you'll ask clarifying questions, and it might then later need to be a workshop, um, but it's just more of a, a sit and get opportunity where we want the workshops we're trying to make them more interactive, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, and in italics, um, after 
the topic, you'll see who, who from our staff might be presenting or leading that conversation. So tonight, for example, you had the high school grading and reporting. It says SHS principal and staff, as you experienced, and then diploma law, director of program and assessment, um, as you experienced tonight. So it also shows you that next month, um, we wanted to do part two of the new board orientation and invite MSMA to come back to work with all of you um, at your request. However, uh, they're not available. It's that, that time of year, once we get close to winter break, everyone kind of, everyone who works in the schools sort of takes a breather and um, so things get really quiet. So they're not available, but our IT director is going to come and do the cybersecurity um, and student security um, training with you along with FOIA. Is that required training? The FOIA is the required training, and all of our staff go through the cybersecurity training. So um, we felt, and, and Jen felt, it was really important for you all to know what the staff is learning um, so you can make decisions. So obviously, already this needs to be updated because MSMA won't be here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I mean by editing it. And then our goal is Eileen has said that she can come back on January 3rd. However, that's not one of your regularly scheduled workshop meetings. Um, I just learned that Sarah won't be here on that day, so I don't know if you guys want to pick a date when you know everyone can come, because that's really your opportunity to establish norms and get really clear about how you're going to work together moving forward. Um, so that may, be, may need to be adjusted. And then um, what we tried to do also was uh, take in some of the questions that you all have been having and say, okay, so how can we provide answers in a way that's not gonna leave you feeling really saturated because you got it all in one three-hour session. And so I know one of the ideas that came up was you know, forming a decision-making committee. And so what we would like to do before the board takes action on that idea is to share with you, much like Michelle did tonight, um, what is the decision-making process? Because each building really has their own process um, and then, of course, we have our district process of how we make decisions, and we'd like to be able to, to share that with you, with um, principals presenting for their school with their staff. That's part of the, you know, that their executive leadership, if you will, at their schools. Um, so I won't read the whole thing with you, but if you have any questions, when I share it with you, you can also comment on the document. So feel free to, you know, ask for clarifying information. One of the things I will just point out you see right up front is long-range facilities after you get on your committees in a little bit here, um, that's gonna be a critical uh, committee to get right to work, um, understanding what work has been done, but also what work may need to be done in the very near future. If there's suggestions, do you, um, suggest, do you suggest that we comment on this document? Yeah, I think that's okay. a great way to do it. Well, I'd like to talk about them. I mean, I, I appreciate all the work that's gone into the production of this document, but one of the, concerns that I've had is trying to get additional board meetings scheduled um, because of the amount of work that we have done and the important work that we have done and um, it's it's partly a learning curve for me I think but it's also um, I think sort of a, a philosophy of this is the way we do things and I don't think that this board is operating like that right now I mean because there are a lot of critical decisions that need to be made, and um, we can't make them hastily, but we do need to, um, I think, increase our work in order to get that accomplished. And so I've been really frustrated about the inability to um, tackle that work. And so I, you know, I think that we need to address the issues that um, we need to, as a board, um, get workshops on and, and meetings on and how we plan to do that. Um, and I think that that needs to occur in public and we need to have discussions in public about that. Can I ask a question about the, um, the NAs on, mm -hmm. the on the dates? Like, so that means there's nothing scheduled but we might be able to schedule something in or does that mean that's not an available date for a workshop? Because that's the It business. just means, well, in this case, it means not applicable because um, typically, again, of course, you can have more meetings if you'd like, um, but you have a business meeting on the first Thursday of the month right. and, and the third Thursday of the month, and then a workshop also happens on the third Thursday. So what the, the past board decided was we used to just have one business meeting, and then the second meeting was a workshop. 
um, but the agenda was getting really long, much like tonight for business meetings, and so they um, decided to have workshops before, much like the council does, the business meeting on the third Thursday, so that then business could still be done, and those meetings would hopefully be shorter because you're you're conducting your business more frequently. Um, so that's it. Just means that typically there's not a workshop on those days. So we need to vote on the um, a calendar on, by March first. Is that correct? The school district calendar. Yeah. Yes. So one of my concerns is that you know this year we've we've got the change of school start times and we need to sort of talk to all the stakeholders and find out how that's working and we've changed the bus um, structure from a three tier structure to a two tier structure. We need to get feedback on how that's working for. Mm -hmm. Um, the schools and for the kids and for the parents and, and how people are feeling about that. And so there are topics like that that I think are really important and I understand that a lot of this work is necessary as well and I'm all up for it. I don't mean to minimize the stuff that you've identified at all. But, but my concern is, you know, how are we going to go about adding all of the things that we need to do into this calendar? What's, what's the plan for us to do that so that we get that done and so that we can hear from, I don't want to be rushed, I want to make sure that we hear from all of those people and that we're getting that, that feedback. I'm more than happy to work additional workshops, I'm more than happy to do whatever we need to do to make it happen, but my concern is that I feel like we're not moving, we're not mindful enough about our planning in, in some of those regards. The, the diploma changes, the grading, um, the school start times, there are things that we need to do in addition to that, and, and how are we going to go about doing that? So specific to those questions, what the work that you have to do in March is to approve the calendar, and so that's just how are the 177 school days and 182 staff days going to lay out. Okay. And that will, that conversation really starts in February after um, we're able to meet with our regional partners because one of the requirements we have is we have to have a common calendar. And start times do not have to be decided on at that time. Typically, we put start times on our calendar, but those are two very separate um, actions, if you will. Um, in terms of studying the current start times, much like you heard the plan, do, study, act cycle that we're using with grading and reporting, we're using that same cycle when it comes to the start time implementation. And so the Leadership Council has been studying a variety of data points and looking at is this new, is the new start time actually yielding some of the outcomes that we had anticipated. And I'll just give two examples, but happy to share more. One was that we hope to increase breakfast sales and breakfast consumption so that our students are getting um, getting breakfast before the school day starts. And so we're looking at that month, monthly data to see, have our sales actually gone up? Are more students eating breakfast at school? Um, another data point that we're looking at is maximizing the instructional day. So we have our students for six hours and 25 minutes, but with our previous system, our K-2 schools never started on time to the point when I came to the district, I could, people didn't even really know necessarily what the real start time was because they were 15, 20 minutes late every single day. A lot of people thought that they started at 9 or 9, 10, and in fact, they always have been at 850. That hasn't changed. Um, and at Wentworth, too, they were experiencing maybe a, a smaller um, challenge, but five to seven minutes on any given day where they weren't able to start the instructional day on time. So that's we're looking at that data. Those would be two examples, but of course, there's much more, like first period failure rates and things like that. Um, so. We, if I, I think a great place for that work to happen is in the communi communications and outreach committee. So if we decide we want to do community forums or some sort of community survey, that committee can make that recommendation to the full board um, and get that work going in that way. And also know that we're doing it too um, in different ways internally. I just wanted to add about our calendar. Um, our calendar, um, we work together with uh, GORM uh, Scar uh, Scarborough, Westbrook, um, Wyndham, and um, Bonnie Eagle. And um, our calendar has to match with those other districts for the vocational school. We can only be out of sync five days for all of us uh, to get the calendar approved. 
So we'll be starting our work probably the end of January with those other districts and coming up with what days school will begin, what days will we have a PD day for the five districts so that it all coordinates. But we have to do that kind of work uh, first with those districts in order to bring you a calendar back because it has to match. So when would be a good time, like, it sounds like Alicia is interested in, like, a similar presentation like we had about the grading reporting and an opportunity to ask questions about the calendar. When, when will you have enough information to do something like that? Like, about the that, start times specifically? Well, about the calendar, I guess. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess I, this is another uh, sort of thing that I'm having a hard time with. And, and, you know, so there's work going on, justifiably so, you know, with the, with the stakeholders. But, but we're sort of operating in our own sphere here when we don't have access to any of that information. But ultimately, we're going to have to vote on this calendar that includes start times, which um, implicates transportation. And we need to make sure that we're asking those questions and that we're hearing the feedback from those people. And so I don't want to wait until the last minute to get that information and that input. And I want to be able to ask meaningful questions of those stakeholders. And so my concern is that, again, there's like a level of detachment in, in, in sort of the, the information sharing. Yeah, so just let us know when you're, you want to have that presentation or workshop topic and we're, we're ready to do it at any time. So how would I request an additional meeting to do that if, if we need to um, work more frequently? Can I make a recommendation for mm -hmm. this question? I think we had agreed that we would meet uh, on the 20th, potentially. Sarah, can you speak up? Yep, sorry. Okay. I think we had agreed that we would meet potentially on the 20th in advance of our existing meeting. Maybe at that meeting, we all bring together and say, here's what the schedule looks like over the next year and things that we'll need to know and when we'll need that information instead of just one-offing it. And so that we can then build our priorities together as a board mm -hmm. and then go back and make sure that that aligns with you know, Julian and everybody else's so, schedule. So on the 20th, we'll be addressing um, how we're gonna increase our workload to address all of the work that we need to do. Is that your suggestion? Yeah, I think there, or potentially we may find that a lot of the answers to the questions we have can actually be done in the committee work instead mm -hmm. of in mm -hmm. informal board right. meetings as okay. well. Right. So if we organize it in that way, um, I don't know if the 20th meeting is, is official yet, but I think that was a date that worked for everybody, so. Well, we have yeah, a I, board meeting on the 20th. Uh, yeah, I think it was like 4 o'clock or something. Right, so that yeah. would be the workshop. So yeah. cybersecurity is, some, is what Jen wanted to do, and then the MSA MA isn't available, so we could do instead of the MSMA. Right. I think that's part of what's challenging, is that we haven't finished our board orientation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we haven't had an opportunity to um, have a retreat in public for, you know, or call it a workshop. I don't care what we call it, but we haven't had an opportunity to work in public to start to develop our board norms, our protocols, uh, what processes are we going to use, I love the idea of, of having the, the Communication and Outreach Committee um, do that data collection in terms of what's going on with start times with some of the, some of the um, I mean, even like I'm hearing out in the community that there are so many primary uh, school parents um, transporting their, their um, kids to school every day and picking them up. Um, so I mean that's obviously an impact on busing because they're not using the service of transportation as much because of it. So. I think we need to do that meeting on the 20th, like Sarah suggested. I think that's a great idea. And we need to give ourselves a mechanism to do this work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we're all a little bit <coughs> frazzled, because we're ready to work. I mean, Julie called us eager. I mean, <laughs> that's true. I mean, we're, we're ready to do this work, but we need, to, we need to figure out how we're going to do it. So the point of clarification I would just need is what time you want that meeting to happen and who you would like to facilitate that meeting if you want it to be somebody internally or if you want it to be someone externally. And that can, Leanne can give me that guidance. So. Any other questions about this document? Again, I'll share it with you electronically and it's just meant to be a framework to sort of guide our thinking. Thank, Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for initiating that conversation. One of our goals has been since we, you know, began this process was to be more transparent and to have these conversations occur in public. 
I think it's very fair to say that all of us have been experiencing a little bit of frustration and I think one of the best ways that we can alleviate that is to start having these meetings um, and to initiate that public conversation. So, good. Thank you. All right, last piece of my update. Sorry for the longest update in history. Um, but you all have been copied on some emails about skiing and what the status of skiing is um, in our district. So I wanted to just take a moment to give you a little historical perspective and then bring you up to speed with what our current reality is. And so um, we currently do not have a school a skiing program. Um, we had one in the past, uh, long before I was here and long before Mike Legage was our athletic director. The school board sanctioned skiing, however, it was never funded. And so it relied 100% on booster fundraising in order to run the program. And um, just to give you an idea, to run a skiing program um, for 10 to 20 kids, it's anywhere from 30 to $40,000 annually to run that program. So we had a very involved group of parents. Um, Amy has this historical knowledge too. We were chatting about it earlier today. Um, we had a very involved group of parents that did an amazing job fundraising every year and supported this, the, the skiing program. We had a Nordic skiing program and an Alpine skiing program. We also had a middle school program. That program disbanded about two years ago, two or three years ago. Um, Mike and I were trying to figure out exactly when that happened. Um, and then as that disbanded, you know, so did the Nordic program shortly after. The Alpine skiing program went one more year um, with the funding that was available through, through the previous booster fundraising. Um, and last year we had both low interest, part of what disbanded these, it's not, wasn't all funding related, it was student interest. And so as that fluctuated, um, as that core group of parents who were really active in booster fundraising, as their students moved through the system and or graduated, um, there was less support to do that, that advocacy. And it, it really is a lot of work to raise that kind of money each year. So um, this year, uh, Several weeks ago, four or five students came, um, approached our athletic director, Mike Legage, about bringing skiing back. Um, they're passionate skiers. Some of them have skied competitively, and they wanted to compete for Scarborough. And so Mike Legage started working with local, air, um, local districts to see if there were any opportunities. We don't currently have a coach um, for skiing. And so he was looking into the idea of could we have a, um, what's called a cooperative team. And I, I think I printed this for you. I pulled out for you out of the MPA guidelines. Um, do you have it in front of you? Mm -hmm. uh, page 25 is where it talks about cooperative individuals and cooperative teams. So that way you could just sort of see that this is something that districts can do and do do. Um, and we have done before, um, both ways. Um, so, so you have that language there. So it's not a matter of can we have a cooperative um, individual agreement or a cooperative team agreement. We absolutely can and the guidelines are here. Um, the challenge that we had was the sheer number of students who wanted to be involved. And so Mike knew of four or five students um, very early on and, um, and, and suspected that there would be more if we actually brought the program back that there would maybe be 10 or 12 students. So we met, we talked with two other athletic directors in neighboring communities to see what the feasibility would be, if they could accept any of our students, how many could they accept. Um, we talked with Chevers and we also talked with Gorham. Um, Chevers has a smaller team, but they also have a new coach this year and they transport using like a, a van that seats like 14 students. And so we thought maybe they might have three slots available. We looked at, you know, would those be individual agreements? Would they be, would it still be a team agreement? If that was feasible, if they could accept our students, how would we decide which three students? Um, we talked about the idea, just trying to put any ideas out there. We explored the idea of, well, would we do a lottery? How would that play out? What if, you know, the kid that really wanted to ski didn't get chosen? You know, how would that be equitable? Um, none of us agreed that that was really a viable option. So then we talked with Gorham to see how many students could they take on. And really for them, they have a pretty large team. So the maximum number um, that they would be able to accept would be five students. And then we'd still have the challenge of how do we get our kids to Gorham every day? Because they have dry land practice every day. 
and then get them to the mountain once or twice a week. And there's um, 11 competitions where they would also have to get to the mountain. So very quickly adding up the cost, we knew that there would be a financial challenge, but we wanted to see, okay, if we could, outside of the financial challenge, like what's the feasibility? So um, I asked our athletic director to post the coach position, because if we had more than five kids, we would need our own coach, just to see what kind of applicants are out there. To date, we posted it last week, we have zero applicants to date, but we're hopeful. It's open until December 10th. Um, or we were hopeful, I should say. Um, and then I also asked him to host a student interest meeting so we could get really concrete numbers on how many students are we talking about? Is it two or is it 20? Um, and Mike texted me right after the meeting. He was like, okay, so I was wrong. It's 21 kids who are interested. And you know, of these 21 students, 11 of them have competitively skied raced before. Um, and 10 of them feel that they're expert enough that they would be willing and able to compete with you know, some training and things like that. So um, again, this is just the current reality. Here we are. We have more student interest than we've had in a number of years, which is <coughs> super exciting. And so still, we started thinking, you know, what is there any way around this? How can we um, make this happen for our kids? Absolutely, we'd have to have a coach. There's no way to support 21 students with another district cooperative agreement or not. They would want us and require us to not only have a coach, but our own assistant coach in order to be able to do that, which then it's no longer a cooperative agreement because <laughs> we would be having our own program. Um, the anticipated cost all totaled is 33496 based on what we know. That doesn't include any unanticipated costs or any equipment or any gear or team swag or anything like that. That is just straight nuts and bolts what it would take to, to have the program. We what, do have- Is that coaching and busing? That's then? coaching, it's busing, it's lift tickets, it's race fees, it's, um, there's a, a small league fee that's included in that. And then assuming with 21 students, we would have um, probably a male and female, a male identifying and female identifying team of students who would make it to the championship, there's a fee associated with that as well. So um, it's all those kind of sort of little costs, but the big cost is transportation. It would be $17,000 in transportation alone um, just to get kids to and from the competitions. And, um, and this is having our own program. If we did have a cooperative agreement with another school district, we'd then also have to get our kids to their school for dry land practice every day. And this is why we posted the coaching position, because right away it was obvious that it would be more cost efficient for us to just have our own team if it was more than five kids. Um, and even frankly, if it was five kids, because it would we'd have to contract a bus to get them there every day. And they would have to leave school early every day. If we had a cooperative agreement, they'd have to be at Gorham by 245. So they'd miss about 20 minutes of instruction every day if that was um, if that was a feasible option. I don't, it's not with 21 students. And so the part that's frustrating, I think, for us is that we have some money <laughs> left over from boosters. It's just not enough money. Um, and there's no way, I, I don't want to say there's no way, there's a way to make up the $18,496, but it's going to come from somewhere else. Um, and then we're back to curtailing things um, and or not filling things that already are scheduled to be filled. So. Um, I leave it to the board to have an open, honest discussion about this. We really have tried to look at it from every possible angle that we can. Um, you know, we believe deeply that athletics, or not just athletics, but extracurriculars is a huge part of our students' lives. And we know the research is really crystal clear. We know the long-term benefits of students being involved in extracurricular activities. Annually, what's frustrating for us, and probably most frustrating for Mike Legage, is that we, we run a ton of really high quality, highly successful programs and clubs, and we do not fund it properly. We require our parents to pay user fees, and we require them to fundraise, and we require them to buy stuff for not only their, their athletics and extracurriculars, but for their everyday schooling. And so um, I think this is also a really great time to sort of have a community discussion about what, what do we value and how are we going to make sure that it, it's sustainable for our kids? Shouldn't be reliant on whether or not we can get parents to raise $40,000 a year or not. Um, and so I promise you, Mike will be bringing <laughs> real cost to you in this budget cycle and asking for 
you to be able to support his department um, better financially. Um, but this is, this is a heartbreaking moment right now for us because we have so many kids who are willing, able, skilled, highly skilled, and wanting to compete. Um, and we feel a, a bit backed into a corner here. So I'll stop talking and open it up to any discussion or clarifying questions you might have. Mike is here, so I know that he'd be willing to answer questions if, if you have them. Do you know why the team's disbanded? So my understanding um, from my historical study here is that it was partially interest level. So there was a period of time a few years ago when there was less students interested, and it was relying more on a smaller number of parents to have to raise all of the funds. Um, that's my, is that accurate, Mike, would you say? And now we're back, it's, you know, kind of like the pendulum swings. Here we now have a really robust group of, of talented students who want to compete. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the work that has been done to try to figure out how to make this work for what we thought was a very small number of students. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a nice, it's nice that there's 21 kids in Scarborough that want to ski again for a program. Mm -hmm. So I, I would be really interested in seeing how um, in the future we can make that happen. Um, and I don't know what the process would be, but you know, next fall or beginning of school year, or whatever, if, we, if that becomes one of our sanctioned sports again and we work with parents who want to maybe start a booster program because I mean, the reality is we're still going to be relying on boosters to support mm -hmm. Uh, a significant chunk of our athletics, even if we are lucky to get more money into the athletic budget. Yeah. But is it possible to reach out to that group of 21 to see if anybody has any interest in starting a booster program so that at least for next year they could start working on it? Yeah, that was one idea that we talked about, knowing that we now have this heightened interest. Um, you know, now, uh, after... I mean, it's kind of like cold comfort. We can't help this year, but maybe next year if you help out. They'd really, we would want them to get started now thinking about a fundraising strategy because as all of you know who are involved in boosters, it takes all year to, to generate those funds. And um, so I think that that would be a really positive, productive next step is to connect with those folks and see if we can get them um, organized and motivated to, um, to advocate for this program. While also I would, you know, really like to see this board um, take a close look at our athletic programs this year and um, you know, make maybe a three-year or a five-year plan to get to funding it more, um, more consistently. I think if it was this year, can we, if it's 20% this year of every program, can it be 30% next year or 50%? I mean, I'd like it to be 50% this year, but we'll, um, Mike would like it to be 100%. Um, <laughs> but I think some sort of long-range strategy, and you're creating this community discussion about it, because, I, I, I mean, 90, 92%, Mike, is that accurate? About 92% of our kids are involved in some sort of club or sport, or is that low? Oh, sure. It's about 92%, and that's awesome. Like, there are positive life outcomes that come from this involvement, which helps our whole society, not just our, our little community here. Um, but our budget's just over a million dollars. I mean, we have hundreds of athletes um, who are doing, who are really talented and doing really amazing things. So thank goodness for our boosters and our parents that raise about a half a million dollars every year to buy essential things like football pads, like hockey pucks, like um, tape, like equipment, you know, just to, to make the programs run. But um, I just don't I, don't, I don't think that that's right. I don't think that that's us delivering on our mission. Um, and so I would, I'd like to see the board rally around that and make a good plan. What's the, what's the process to communicate with those 21 students and parents moving forward about um, potentially developing a long-range plan to get that sanctioned? And is it already sanctioned? Because I know it was. Is it's, it, sanctioned, like, does that... it's sanctioned but not funded. Right, so you don't have, you don't have to resubmit that. So just figuring out what, what's that plan and how we're going to communicate as a district to those families that are interested in maybe starting that again. Sure. So the process would be for the athletic director um, who knows who the students are. They signed in. Um, he pulled them on their abilities and things. So the process would be for him to plan a parent meeting. Um, and I'm sure he would appreciate if board members attended that meeting to talk specifically about 
um, where we are, you know, and to and to um, be really clear that this is disappointing for all of us, m most disappointing for our students for sure, um, and and try to um, gauge the temperature for their willingness to to partner with us to develop some sort of fundraising strategy because the reality is we need to fundraise um, and fund for at least a year and then you know how do we make sure that if of these students how many of them are juniors or younger and know that they'll want to compete next year that would be a really good um, kind of starting point I think for maybe some of the parents who are seniors they'd probably help out I would imagine knowing our community um, but I think getting that younger investment would help make it more sustainable are the 21 students all interested in alpine skiing yes that was the specific conversation okay. was around competitive so there ski could racing. be even more who might be interested in nordic skiing isn't that a, i mean you can race in nordic skiing right do you mike do you want to sorry i just learned how to ski <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not the expert there could there could be um more students in Nordic. We haven't focused on Nordic for probably four years. Um, we, at the end of it, we had two students doing Nordic. Um, and then those, those kids were graduating. And so we didn't continue it the next year. Um, but everything that said is right. We, the uh, program started a year, was, a, was sanctioned by the school board a year before I started, so 10 years ago. Um, it was sanctioned with no funding. Um, at the time, that group of parents agreed to support the program mm -hmm. financially. Um, and the metamorphosis of it is just as Dr. Kuchenberger said, that um, they started, the program at the middle level started to collapse. And so we had, about two years ago, I held a, a meeting for all the ski parents at that time when they were still active mm -hmm. and said that, you know, we needed to get things going and we needed to do the fundraising and, and um, they were going to work on it. And then the, then the fundraisers came and went and they didn't do them. If you remember, the ski sale was a big... It not only was a big fundraiser for skiing, but it really became a community event. Mm -hmm. And they chose not to do it that year. So that was a huge missed opportunity. And then it kind of continued from there. And the, and the group just kind of fell apart. At that time, too, we had very few students interested. So I think that was part of it, too. Um, and so, which is the case, I mean, people come and go on, on booster groups and, you know, their children graduate, they move on, new people come in. Um, and so now we have a new crop of younger folks um, who were really interested, so it was great to see. I mean, I, I was shocked. I kept saying, oh, I think we're going to have 10 to 12 kids. And then when the room filled up, it was, it was great to see. It's a great problem, but it's a problem. And as Dr. Kuchenberger said, I think it's a problem in all athletics. We really are holding it together with a shoestring. And um, we get about 350,000 from boosters every year to maintain our programs at that current level. And we probably get another 150 from activity fees. Um, so about 500,000 and um, <clears throat> that still doesn't quite pay for everything. Mm -hmm. So we get some donations um, in other places too and, and some gate revenue and those things used to help offset um, the operating budget. So I've come every year and put those things in the budget. Skiing's been in the budget every year to, <laughs> to take on. It's always been cut. Um, we had one bad year a few years ago where about 150000 of my budget was cut. That was the year that seventh grade sports went away and some transportation went away and those things. Um, so it, it is true what Dr. Kugenberger said, and I'm an athletic director, so of course I want kids in programs or I don't have a job, right? So, um, so what, but what she said is true is that at some point in time we need to decide if we're going to uh, do these programs, they need to be properly funded or don't do them, because this is the type of thing that happens. Mm -hmm. 
what's happening right now is what I've been saying for nine years and the type of thing that ends up happening. And so you have to at least fund the essential components. The extra stuff, banquets and nice bags and those things, I think that's what boosters can help with. But at least fund the essential things that we need to actually hold the activity, to do the activity. And we still have a lot of things that were cut um, from back then at that time. They haven't come back yet still. You know, art club, things like that. So, um, so I appreciate what Dr. Kuchenberger said about that. We're still going to have upset people, um, but it's the way it is. Thank Mike, you. if there's a new booster group fun, um, that comes together for skiing, would they automatically have access to that $15,000? Yes, that's why we held it um, okay. in, an, in, the, in the account um, for that purpose. Very similar to what we did um, about... I guess it was my, just my first year we had an, uh, an outing club. Um, I think it was just my first year I was here, we had an outing club. And then that outing club stopped. And there was actually a group of kids now that want to bring back the outing club as well. Mm -hmm. And that club had $400 left over that we've kept in an account too for that purpose. Yeah. So that money would be available for them to start up and you know, start up with. But at this point, I think it's, it's, it would be a huge challenge. We'll see what happens by December 10th if we get any candidates. But we also have a school board policy of a 20 to 1 ratio in athletics. And um, so I think we'd be looking at needing to try to find two people. Um, and the likelihood of that, I think, is going to be challenging. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. No. Um, given the time, I would ask for a motion to extend tonight's meeting to 10 o'clock. Um, we have yet to start our new business, which I'd also like to move up in the agenda if folks are agreeable to stay for an extra 45 minutes. So moved. So moved. So moved. Any discussion? Moved. Second. Second. I knew where you were going now. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? All right, that'll be six and two. All right. Sorry, I'm all grabbing with that way. It's yours. I'm taking it. All right, we're going to go into new business. Starting with the school board committee assignments. I'm going to get to that. Skip all that stuff. Do you need to do that? Well, no, but I need to be able to. Actually, I don't suppose I have to show it about, do I? You don't, but I can get that for you. Okay, you get that. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start with something that Nick had written um, with respect to committees and sent to me and asked that I read it tonight. Um, good evening, everyone. I apologize for not being with you tonight. I would like to ex express my continued excitement for working with each of you on the Scarborough Board of Education. Like most shared gov governance structures, much of the work we do and changes we cultivate will come from our service on standing committees and other peripheral groups. Given the importance of this work, I'd like to commend our board chair, Leanne, for the collaborative and inclusive approach she took in drafting the appointments to each of the committees and groups presented tonight. Not only did Leanne follow established policy to the letter, but she solicited additional input from each and every board member so that she could more clearly understand our wishes in various areas of expertise. Having reviewed the draft with her as vice chair, I'd like to wholly and completely endorse the work that she has done. I think these teams will service the school board, the school district, and community of Scarborough very well over the coming year. Take care and happy holidays. Dr. Nicholas Gill, vice chair, Scarborough Board of Education. Okay. <coughs> so, this was probably one of the hardest and funnest puzzles to put together. Um, a lot of work went into this. It was intended to be a very collaborative process, um, asking folks what do they enjoy, working within policy to ensure that we populated folks properly. Um, one of the things that Hillary and I have found when we had gone to a workshop is even though our policy states the board chair is a de facto member, we really can't do that because that makes a quorum of the board. Um, so that had to shuffle a little bit as well and 
the board chair for the first time is a member of committees. Um, but again, a lot of work went into this, a lot of thought, and I'll talk about different pieces of it. Um, for finance, Sarah Layton will be the chair of the finance committee, working with myself and April Sider. Outreach and communications, Hillary has done an, a tremendous job with this, um, so she'll be remaining as chair, working with Sarah in April. And what's really important with that committee connection is so much of the work that communications does really centers on the most critical point of finance. Without a strong finance team and communicating the needs of that budget, we cease to exist. So it's incredibly important to have those really tight ties between the two teams. Um, so thank you guys for taking on those pieces. Negotiations, um, Amy Glidden will be chairing that with Hillary and Nick. Um, again, this is gonna be a very critical group. There will be a motion that I'd like to make with respect to negotiations that until we have completed our bus driver's poly um, contract that we retain the work of Jackie Perry and Mary Starr in order to ensure that we have continuity of that contract all the way through until it's completed in addition to the existing negotiation members. If someone would be willing to make that motion. So moved. Second. Discussion about that? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> My one concern, and it's not a concern um, that I don't think that they should be included. Um, the, I'm concerned about how they are communicating with people who still have um, Scarborough Schools email addresses. Um, I don't feel like the communication that takes place because of the nature of negotiations should be taking place with people's private emails. And so if that um, is something. So no communication about negotiations should be happening via email at all outside of like saying there's a meeting on this date. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, we, have been, we don't communicate. There's no documents, there's no meeting minutes, there's no agendas. There are no meeting doc, minutes no. or agendas. Okay. No. Yeah. I, I have sent information to um, board members who are on negotiating because of a meeting coming up that they kind of needed to read something, but we don't keep minutes. I mean, they keep notes, but those are not. Each, each person keeps their own notes. So when I have jo sent out Joanne, emails, just to clarify, you don't keep meeting minutes because you're not allowed to, not just because right. you don't want right. to. Okay. Right. 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 We, don't, we just don't do that. Just, just, <laughs> no. Well, the way she said it, yes. to clarify. Yes. Yes. But I'll send not, an email. Because she doesn't I'll feel like it. We have a date for this and time and place. Okay. And I think the other important thing for the community to understand is that um, the, this board is the board that will make the decision on the contract. So although they'll continue the negotiations conversation as we're at this fact-finding point, um, and that document is going to become public very soon, um, they will be making a recommendation to this board, but this board will make the ultimate decision. They don't have any decision-making authority. Right. And I feel confident in that um, information. I, I literally was the like logistics of if there was ever documents or anything that was o sent over email, my concern was that we are in violation of board policy. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, policy, I'll be chairing that one. I didn't realize how much I would enjoy Wait, working. Leanne, you never oh, voted. Oh, I did, didn't, didn't I? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, all those in favor? Thank you. Six and two. Thank you. Um, part of the earlier piece was giving ourselves a moment of zen, um, realizing that mistakes will be made, and that was a pretty big one, so apologize for that. Um, That's not a big one. Oh, yeah. It will um, still be relevant after you do this. It will. So for policy, um, I'll be working with Alicia and Amy. I'm really excited about what, how much passion is going to be coming into that committee, and I look forward to really attacking, um, strong word, but 
working, digging into a lot of the policies that have been in, in place that have not been looked at um, in quite some time. So we'll get those meetings underway shortly. And then long range planning, Nick will be chairing that with Sarah in April. And in looking at the enrollment numbers, that has, again, a huge tie to finance. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that our enrollment is growing exponentially, and that's before the new project starts. So I think there's a lot of work to be had with long-range planning. Liaisons, um, legislative, Alicia Giftos will be leading that. And Jackie Perry had mentioned numerous times the value of this specific liaison. Um, how often they're able to work with legislation. We know that from the presentation earlier, diploma laws could come back into play. So this is a very critical position to ensure that we are aware of what's happening and that we have that voice in Augusta who can go and speak to the folks making those decisions. Um, while I can write a letter as a town, you know, as an individual, hearing from another elected official carries so much more weight. So Alicia, thank you for taking that on. Um, vocational, the CTE and the PATS team. April, thank you for taking that. And teacher evaluation will be Amy Glidden. Um, requested committees that will have school board representation. Health safety and advisory team will be Alicia. The comprehensive needs assessment planning team is April. Dropout prevention team, Sarah Layton. Um, I've been hearing more and more about this, the chronic absenteeism, so I believe this is gonna be a, another very powerful team to be working with. Um, community business partnership, I'm so sad to give it up because I absolutely loved it, mm -hmm. but Nick Gill will be taking that. I just set a meeting date too. I know, I was a little crushed. <laughs> um, the K-12 professional development redesign team, Amy, thank you. And the pre-K task force, <coughs> Hillary Durkin, will be remaining on that. And then there's two special committees um, that, or, that are being proposed as part of this process. Um, first of them is the superintendent search committee. And under policy, um, the board chair does chair that one and two other members. So Nick and Sarah will be part of this um, very specifically because Nick has done these sorts of searches at the college level and Sarah because by trade she is a project manager and this may be one of our largest projects. Um, this group is the initiation process only just so that folks know that part. Um, it gets underway of finding who is the search committee that will be undertaking the hiring process, working with um, what are the search firms that will be working for this because again that's a full-time position to hire a new superintendent. So we'll be working with that, bringing back to the full board who we're proposing to be that committee, or that firm, excuse me, um, and then initiating the actual hiring interviewing panels. Um, that panel would be part of the staff, the teachers, community members, students, as well as board members to conduct those interviews. And then the full board will have an opportunity to interview the candidates as well. So there's a lot to be had, but this is just that initial piece that goes underway. And then another new committee would be the curriculum committee, chaired by Hillary with Nick and Amy. And it, again, tying that back to communication, being able to collaboratively, oh my gosh, it's getting late, collaboratively work with a director of curriculum um, in order to work through the assessment action plans, communicate our curriculum guide, make sure that the community knows everything that is happening within curriculum and ensuring that everything is being completed and shared internally and externally. All right, so all of that said, a lot of talking. Is there a motion to accept the committees, the representatives, the liaisons as presented? Can we have discussion? After as soon as the motion. motion. Oh, after so motion. moved. Second. Second. And discussion or questions? <laughs> so the superintendent search committee, uh, is there gonna be just one committee or are there gonna be more than There will be three. Three committees? Basically three committees. There will be the initiation one that we established the yes, we're going out to search for a superintendent. Um, and that will be looking at the firms that do the searches. Mm -hmm. So evaluating those and then evaluating 
at the timelines, when would we go to create the next round, which is the hiring committee? So that's committee number two. Okay. And then there's the full board that is involved as committee number three. So that does the interviews. Which one is that, the superintendent search committee? This is the initiating. The initiating. And so we'll form the second committee later? Yes. Gotcha. Am I right in assuming that this first committee will make a recommendation for how to form the second committee and who should be on it? Okay. Yes. It'll work through the composition, the timing of when that would come into play. Um, it's amazing how much information is at your fingertips with Google, but I've been looking at different districts um, and how they've done this, and there's a lot to be gleaned, so there's a lot of work. Um, we will need to get this underway sooner rather than later, so we'll start working through those pieces um, probably a little bit before Nick gets back, Sarah, and then ground in with him so we can potentially be able to make a recommendation on the 20th. Um, again, not trying to be overly aggressive, but this is a mission critical moment for us and it's not something that we can take lightly. Yeah. And identifying the firm will be really helpful for, they'll help you plan and coordinate the timeline and all of that, so. Correct. That's, yep. Any other conversation? All those in favor? Thank you. Six and two? I was just going to thank Leanne for, it, it wasn't an easy job <laughs> to do that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and, and thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, 12.2, vote to authorize amendments to the MSMA Group Insurance Declaration of Trust. So I could speak a little bit to this if it's helpful to give a little background for the public. <coughs> Did we talk about this at the last board meeting? No, no. right? So you have a memo in front of you um, with the amendments that um, Kate has created that outlines really the process. So um, if there's any questions about them, I can, I'm happy to take a stab at answering them, but. Um. I'm assuming Kate, this is, we, these, this is something Kate endorses, right? And, absolutely. And recommends that yep, it, absolutely. Right. Our hope is that you would choose to approve them. Any other questions about them? No. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Motion. Oh, sorry. Motion to. <laughs> wow. Motion to um, authorize the amendments. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Good. All those in favor? Thank you. Six and two. I would like to bundle 12.3, the meeting minutes workshop of October 18th, 12.4, meeting minutes for the business meeting of October 18th, and then the meeting minutes of October 1st into one motion. November 1st. Mm -hmm. Is that not what I said? <laughs> it's getting late. It's been a long day. There's a reason why we have that. <laughs> yeah. um, is there a motion to accept the meeting? Meeting minutes as written. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Six and two. Okay. Appointments. 12.6.1. Um, we could group all of these together as okay. well. Um, you have before you a document that outlines the high school world language department head. Um, the Scarborough Central Certification Co-Chairs, the National Honor Society Co-Advisors, and the High School Winter Athletic Coaches. I would just bring your attention to the uh, last column there that shows you whether it is something that is funded through the general fund or if it's booster funded. Um, when you can see that we also have some volunteers um, serving as assistant coaches. My um, ask would be for the board to accept the appointments as printed. So moved. Second. Okay. Any comments? I, I just have a couple of questions. What is the Scarborough Central Certification co-chairs? What are so, they? So um, about five years, no, maybe longer than that, the state um, moved all their certification approval process to each school district, and each school district had to come up with 
a uh, committee that certifies teachers. So in our district, we have a uh, coordinator at each phase level. And when I'm a teacher and I won't need to have my certification is up, I have to document, I have to do a plan. Two years prior to my certification being up, I work with the coordinator, and then the coordinator takes my plan and brings it to the central committee, and they approve it. And if they approve it, then that person can apply for their certification to be renewed. Thank you. And then I just had a couple of other questions. Um, there were two um, positions that are highlighted in yellow. One is um, uh, the varsity assistant cheering coach. Mm -hmm. That's to be determined. And then the other is the varsity girls assistant track coach. That's to be determined and there's no stipend indicated for that. How so, does that work and, and why is there no stipend? Sure. sure, so that means we haven't yet identified a candidate and there, it probably should be blank under stipend for the varsity assistant cheering coach as well because the way stipends are calculated is um, through the through negotiations there is a stipend rubric um, and Leanne or Joanne yeah. has worked really closely in developing that and it, so it looks at years of experience, numbers of students um, participating and uh, qualifications and that determines what the amount is. Right. Um, so they're just highlighted because they're not yet filled. Okay. So they're so if they're advertised and just not filled, is that yep. right? The status. Okay. And Thank so you. they will come back to you for approval. Okay. Thank you. If you know anybody, Tom to apply. <laughs> I say my only comment is I'm really excited about Coach Stevenson back coming back for wrestling. So. No bias there. No bias. <laughs> Not only that. Is it, is it common that um, the board approves these after the season starts, or is that just mm -hmm. kind of a crossover? Thing? It's actually not something that requires board approval, yeah. but it's been a tradition here for the oh, board okay. to approve them, so yeah. we continue to bring them to you. Right. Um, <laughs> and yes, it's always after the season it's starts. <laughs> <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> All right. Um, but we, we can talk about that process, whether or not we want it to continue or not. But as you can see, we're always, we're usually always. hiring as the season starts, too, right. um, despite our best efforts. So, okay. good question. Thanks. Any further discussion? Okay. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Excellent. Six and two. It does make the coaches feel good, though, when you vote. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Let's go backwards. OK. Um, going back to the chair's report. Actually, you want me to get you there? Yes, please. I'm all ready. Um, I actually chose a quote, and I try to start most of my days with one, and this one had come up, that the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And this was really for me, it was a reminder that we do have a lot of things ahead of us, but to give ourselves that moment to breathe, to get our feet under us, to know that, hey, I'm going to make mistakes, I'm going to make lots of mistakes, but I will improve as we get there. Um, but knowing that it all begins with taking that very first step, which we have done. Um, I think there's some great conversations um, that can be had and will be had. And to that point, I'm kind of breaking with what a chair's report usually is um, and making it more of an interactive conversation. Um, the first piece is really just a quick update regarding agenda setting. Um, right now, the agenda doesn't give a lot of detail. It's been, it, it, it's tough. You see a topic and the community doesn't necessarily know. We don't necessarily know what it is about. Um, communications has done a great job of putting out info snippets on the Facebook page so that the community is aware of what we're talking about or what something means. Um, I will make sure that as agendas are going out, if I don't give the information to Kelly as the agenda goes of what the topics are and what's being covered, I will get something within 24 hours. I'll try to do a much better job of getting it in in less time, but just so that there's some understanding as to what the different agenda items are. 
just so it's not a black box or um, some, something that it doesn't have enough content to make sense. Um, Share drive. That is, as Julie had mentioned earlier, something that we're working on. I know that's something I'm super excited to see in place. So we will have a share drive for all of our documents that will be available for the board. We'll be able to put things that we have out there, things we're working on. Everyone will be able to get in to read what's going on in the different committees as a way to stay informed. Again, being able to get to that, all of that work that is in there. Um, the Joint Finance Committee, we had had a Joint Finance Committee when I started last year, I believe it was the second year that it had been in place. Mm -hmm. Or the third? Third year. I think it was the third or fourth. Third or fourth year. Yeah, yeah. it's Julie's idea. Four years. Okay, four years. I didn't want to assume that we would move forward with that, so I had spoken with Peter Hayes. He asked if I was interested, and I told him I would come back to the board and ask for conversation about this. Did we want to continue with that? I think it's a fabulous idea but I don't want to speak for everybody without getting input on this, so I'd open this up for conversations. I'm in favor of um, at least exploring the opportunities and then we can figure out how it works best for us and with whoever is on their finance committee as well, um, making whatever changes we need to, but I think we should at least start from a place of wanting to work with them collaboratively. That's my view. Is everyone on, does everyone understand how how our budget gets set? Is that process clear to everybody? In terms of, um, we we develop a budget proposal which comes you know from the staff through the principals to the leadership council. Um, we pull that together as a proposal and we present it to you as a board, um, and then it becomes your budget. But ultimately, the town council sets the bottom line. So it's really important for them to understand what our drivers are and what our priorities are, what our needs are, um, and the financial impact of that. The, they can then say, yes, we approve this budget, and they're, you know, when they go to, the, when we have our first reading, um, but they can also tell us that we need to reduce our budget in certain ways or increase our budget in certain ways, and I'm waiting for that to happen. Um, <laughs> I'm hopeful. Um, and the, the one thing that they can't do, the council doesn't have purview over, is individual line items. So they can't say reduce this part of your budget, but they can reduce the overall budget to meet town-wide goals um, or agreed upon goals. So what's been great about the Joint Finance Committee is A, it, it's a dialogue and it's a conversation and you're working collaboratively on you know one budget because we are one community, um, but it also allows, allows for us to have really open conversation about what's in the budget and why. Um, so that when we are asking for increases, um, they, they know where it's coming from. I mean, I think that the more opportunity for collaboration, the better off we are. I, I know that one of the ideas that I've heard floated around is um, a budget advisory committee, and that's um, another area that I think would be interested in exploring. I'm not sure of the mechanism for mm -hmm. forming that and, and um, filling that, but I think that that would be really helpful to try to um, get us to where we need to be come budget season. So I'd be interested in discussing that as well. I would as well. I think I'd be really interested in having the finance committee kind of tackle that in terms of having a, you know, a discussion about the pros and cons of having that, what it might look like, maybe start small this year, pilot something. Um, the listen and learns are great. Um, their budget, the community event they had last year. And was that the first year for those, mm -hmm. I think? And they were really good too, but I think even having um, an opportunity for interested community members, even teachers, parents, uh, people who don't have kids in the school anymore to kind of come together and, and um, talk about the budget and talk about values and priorities and have a common understanding and maybe, maybe you know, a, an opportunity for people to find common ground. It might be um, really helpful, or at least worth a discussion. I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of a joint finance committee. It just seems like a, a no-brainer to me. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll share with Peter that, yes, we're, we're in. Um, he also offered up the opportunity to 
um, whether or not we would want to have a joint team building with town council. They're bringing in a facilitator to do that team building and offered us that opportunity to explore if we wanted to join in. Um, again, going hand in hand with that joint finance committee, it seems like a really great idea. We do work very collaboratively as elected officials. Um, it will give us a chance not only to work with them, but maybe in a way to find more common ground amongst ourselves as well. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out as something to talk about publicly. Again, where we really can't communicate that stuff over emails or through phone calls. It is far more transparent to have this conversation about how did the board and the town council wind up together if that was the way that we went. So <laughs> yeah. opening this up for conversation. So is there a cost associated with that, Leah? Um, I don't know that at this point. I'm not sure who I'm sure the, the facilitator will be. I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, my understanding is that they're doing it regardless mm -hmm. of whether the board joins or not. Okay. So we can join in for free? Just sharing a survey. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're doing it either way. We'll one. just we sneak in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Do I want to speak for the council? Do you have a, like an agenda or understanding of the framework that they'll use for the mm -mm. board? No. No, um, he really just asked that if there, if there was an interest, is it something that we would want to participate in? As I long would. as there's no trust falls. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I guess get back to him and say that, well, I don't, if we all agree that there's an interest, but I think we probably would like some more information about okay. what it involves and how much it costs. <laughs> and when, and when. when, when it is, right? right. The time commitment. To develop an agenda with um, a few people from the council and from imagine. the board. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. For a group like that. I think it's a cool opportunity. I thought so. All right. Um, again, taking notes. And then the last two really are just plugs. Um, project graduation, you may have seen notices around town that there's a possibility that there isn't enough money to support project graduation for this year. I know that there's folks who are fundraising like crazy Unfortunately, I have not been able to attend any of the meetings because of what time they are and being on a Monday. Um, but this is incredibly worthwhile. What this offers to our students is a great send off. Um, I hope that the community can come behind this and help support the project graduation efforts. I have been to some of those meetings and um, the problem is that usually there's a carryover um, fund for the next year and they really were um, short on the receiving end and so they had a lot of fundraising to do and they're really behind and they also want to build up the pot for for next year and so um, I think what is imperative when we think about fundraising for project graduation is the reason why it started and that's to give kids a safe place mm -hmm. to celebrate graduation and we're really I mean it, it was formed for a reason, and, and that's obviously because of teen deaths and, and associated with, with drinking and driving and, and accidents. And so if there's ever a fundraiser that I think that we all need to consider contributing to, it, it's that. And I What's know that that group is working really hard, and they are. Right. What's the avenue for making a donation? How, do, how does the community go? Where do they go to make a donation? That's a good question. There's a um, Facebook page that they can sure donate there's a, through. There's a donate there's link a, right yes. there on their Facebook page. They're also doing um, a letter uh, writing drive to local businesses. And so um, we're hoping that they'll do that. The, um, They're doing a sea bag fundraiser. You can buy a sea bag with a Scarborough yeah. logo on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that was for the that's specific. That's for class of 2020. Oh, oh I thought that. That's for yes. it is. Yes, yes. yes. Oh. that's for class of 2020. But you should still buy one. <laughs> they are really <laughs> cool. They're, they're very cool. They'll also be selling calendars, um, like raffle calendars, and so buy some of those. It's a lot. Great common theme here: fundraising, yes. career pathways, fundraising. Oh, for and that they have, too. actually, I know that Scarborough graduation has clink bags too. Yes, project graduation. Yes. Do they have clink? Yeah. Okay. All right, and then next Wednesday night, the 13th, is the Holiday Band and Chorus Fundraiser. 
Thursday. Oh, Thursday. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it takes a village. It does take a village. This is incredibly important. Not only do the students do a great time, do a great show, got a little bit of a preview <coughs> seeing the high school band last night, even if the two of play are kind of messed up. Um, that would be my son. So, <laughs> Mom. It's okay. Um, I don't know. He said it coming out. So, the more important part is that all of those donations, the funding goes to the Scarborough Backpack Program. Um, in conjunction with the very generous donation we got tonight, all of those proceeds go there as well, and that is one of the most worthy causes. And this is a long winter break. It's it one of the longest that we'll have because of near, or Christmas Eve falling out on Monday. So get out, have some holiday spirit, and uh, support the backpack program. All right, the next one. Um, I'll be the first to admit it. I am an incredibly cautious person. I try to do things in accordance to the law. Um, it's a very good idea. Um, yeah. You know, also with policy and procedures, and I want to do things right. I don't want to lead us in directions that may not be proper. Um, so I've taken it very seriously that you've elected me into this spot, and I'm not attempting to be like stonewalling or saying things aren't important. I just want to make sure we do it right. Um, so I did reach out to um, MSMA for some more information regarding special meetings and emergency meetings because in my not so long tenure, we've had one special meeting and I did not call for it, so I didn't know how it came about. What did it mean? How did we get there? Um, so I got some really good information and special meetings are for a single topic. They require three members to request the meeting and the public must be notified at least three days prior to the meeting occurring. It's meant to address a single issue that comes up between board meetings and something that we have to take an action on. So if we had a budget shortfall and we needed to pay a bill and we couldn't wait for the three week spin like in our last meeting, we could call a special meeting to take action on that one item. Um, and that is the intention of where that comes through. Emergency meetings would be called either by the chair or the superintendent. And for that notification, it would come from the media because it doesn't, if it's an emergency, we're not going to have that three-day notice, so we have to let people know that the meeting is occurring because it still must be public notification of that. Um, and that really would only be if the matter is truly urgent and has to be addressed immediately. So I wanted to share that. Um, I do want to have a conversation about this in public because I know that it may not be a Everyone may not agree with how this has come through, but I really wanted to have an open, frank, honest conversation about when these meetings would come into play and how we would interact in one. Can I respond to that? Absolutely. Um, when, I, when I look at the, the parameters that you've set forth there under special meetings, it looks to me like you're merging um, what the MSBA says um, about the single meeting topic with what our policy says, which is um, not necessarily a referencing the single purpose, but talks about the um, three people need to request it, three days written notice and all that. Um, but the MSBA also says that it could be um, to address important matters that arise between regular board meetings. Um, it could be about um, and, the, and those things require board action before the time for the set, the next set regular meeting. Mm -hmm. Or it could be to consider a single subject in one session, for example, the budget. Um, so there's more than just a single issue reason on the MSBA explanation of it. And when I, when I research this to kind of think about this a little bit, um, there's lots of other school boards who have special meetings that are, um, have more topics than just one single topic. I mean, um, Gorham had 13 special meetings in school year 2017, 2018. They've had um, three special meetings since September of this year. 
And when you look at their agendas, there's some, sometimes there's m multiple items on the agenda. So other, other, other boards are doing, um, and, and Cape Elizabeth had one recently, and they called it a special business meeting, and the entire agenda was, was business items. So there, there are, there are other, other boards that if they have to get more work done, they are using the special meeting as an opportunity to do that. I, I think that it would have been helpful to start the discussion off with the reason why we're addressing this um, in your chair report today, and that's because I made a request for a special meeting on November 20th pursuant to policy. Mm -hmm. And um, our policy requires that if a request is made for a special meeting, it needs to be made by three board members. And then the um, meeting will, will occur and that there will be notice provided to the public. Um, on the same day, November 20th, two, more than two weeks ago, um, that request was seconded and then um, there was a third request made by um, both April Scyther and, and Nick Gill. So just so the public knows, my mm -hmm. request for a special meeting um, was to address um, the superintendent search, which um, since then we've come up with, I think, an, a, an identified plan. Um, the grading and diploma issues um, and the board operating procedures. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm concerned about a number of ways that we're doing business. I'm concerned about the fact that um, there's a lot of work, as I expressed earlier, that needs to get done that's important work. There's the regular board work that a board needs to accomplish that keeps it busy. In addition to that, now we have the grading structure that we need to deal with. And I'm not complaining. I'm saying we need to work harder. We have the diploma decision that we need to make. We have the superintendent search that we need to do. And we have all of, we have the start time, the new start times that we need to get the feedback from all of the stakeholders. And all of those require a lot of collaboration with a lot of people. And it's going to be really time consuming. <laughs> Additionally, we haven't received our full training. We haven't um, uh, identified our board's board operating norms and procedures. So I've made this request um, pursuant to policy. Your chair report um, misrepresents the policy. It, it, there is nothing in our policy that um, indicates that it's for a single issue. Um, the policy is that it would, can be called by three board members, which it was. And um, I think that that request should be honored. I'm, I'm concerned that the board is not able to develop its own plan for when we're gonna meet and the topics that are gonna occur. I mean, I appreciate all the work that Central Office did to help inform that, but, it, but on the other hand, you know, and I know that that's a collaborative process with the superintendent, but on the other hand, you know, the board really needs to decide what, what it wants to do. And it feels like that's not being controlled by the board at this time. And, and um, it's disappointing because I, I want to work on it. Um, the people that I know, we all want to work on it, but it, it feels like there's a there's a there's a power and um, struggle going on, and it's disappointing and it's going to get in the way of our work. So um, I don't understand why we wouldn't just schedule the special meeting. Why we would justify or try to in, interpret and and um, debate the the policy that's pretty clearly identified from my perspective. It's written so that anybody from the general public can, can read it and understand it. It's clear. Um, regardless of what MSMA may have told you independently, that's not what our policy says. And our policy is the governing structure. And so, I mean, we've got work to do and, and I, I'm not looking for excuses to avoid it. This wasn't an excuse to avoid it. Our underlying policy is Robert's Rules of Order, which is far more strict than MSMA or the board policy as it's written today. Um, I understand, yes, that, and I, it's even in the notes about the topics. Um, two of the three we did cover tonight. The meeting was requested right before Thanksgiving break, so we lost some days in there. We also needed to give the staff enough time to create the presentation that we had today, and we could tell from that presentation the amount of effort 
that they put into creating that for us to get the information back. And I want to be able to give them enough time to make that happen. We had one date that worked for us, which was the Tuesday. We didn't take into account whether or not the staff could be able to meet that deadline. Um, the boardmanship absolutely needs to happen, but we do need to have somebody there to facilitate that session. That's and your opinion. I mean, I think that the work needs to happen, and it needs and to happen now. The work that we do as a board is really done in committee. Committee is where things are addressed. The board itself is not going to be the group that creates the survey about a start time. That would come from communication. They will get into that information, and they will present that back to the board in a finding. So that's really where that work comes into play. Well, that's, but, but Liam, the problem with that is that the, the grading reporting, you know, the board didn't have any input about how that was going to happen. And if we had a special meeting, the board could have. And so, you know, I'm not trying to diminish the work that's happened, but it's like, you know, there are, there need, there, like I said, we're operating on two different planes here and there's no, there's no pulling it together. And, and, and um, you know, delaying it, I just don't think is ha it's helpful. Alicia, I, do you mean that you wanted input on the, the actual work that the high school is doing or that you wanted input on how we received the presentation? Because I don't really think it's our place to, they are doing their work and they mm -hmm. will bring it to us. And, right. and that's how that should be, in my opinion. I, so on November 20th, when, when my request initially was to have additional topics put on the agenda, and then that was um, somewhat delayed. And so then I asked for a special meeting so that we could specifically address that. I mean, I think that, you know, the board needs to address how we're going to get that information, who we'd like to hear from, um, find out what's going on. I mean, all of, we're finding this all out as we're receiving it. And so, you know, it... It, it's delaying the decision making and the in the in the information receiving, and to me, you know, put the special meeting request aside. I think that the bigger issue for me is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and it doesn't feel like that's a collaborative process to get to that point. I'm not sure I agree with that. I, okay. Personally. Um, I think we're all really new, and I guess I'll speak for myself. I'm just trying to get understand how things work, and we still have a lot more training that we haven't done. And if there are things that uh, we haven't been able to vote on or make a decision on because we didn't hold the special meeting, then that's uh, that, that's a, that's a mistake. But it doesn't feel like that's the case. I think we all want to get up to speed quicker and faster. The timing of us coming on the board is so unfortunate with the holidays because that's definitely going to set us back mm -hmm. <clears throat> a little bit. And, and that's not an excuse, but I want to move quicker, but I think we need to, move, we need to be smart and, and not just um, move quick just for the sake of moving quick. I, I agree. Yeah. But I mean, we could have had our board operating um, procedures and norms done by now. Yep. Um, yep. And we wouldn't be using the next workshop to do that. I, I mean, we have... We have these issues to tackle, and the, it feels like the response is, well, this is a slow-moving process. I agree. I don't want to rush it, but I think we need to work more. Yeah. I, I disagree, too. I don't think, I, I, I don't feel that this is not collaborative. I don't feel that way at all. Um, I don't disagree that there's a lot of work to be done. I don't necessarily think that a business meeting is the place that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so adding another special meeting to me, it's, it's far more worthwhile to me for, for committees to meet more frequently. A workshop would be great. I mean, I'd, or love, to add I'd love additional workshop. That's fine. Yeah. Like that, that's very different than a special meeting in my mm -hmm. opinion. Like if you had said, I'd really like to have a workshop on the grading, mm -hmm. um, not because we really have a decision to make about it right mm -hmm. now, because we don't but to get information. Yes, that's what we need. Then, then that's very different to me than saying, I, I request a special meeting and I second it and I third it. I mean, that's well, there's, just, there's that's two my opinion. There, there's two separate issues, right? There was this request that is now sort of lingering out there and basically 
um, has been denied. And then there's this issue of we need to tackle a lot of work and how are we going to do that until we wait, until we get trained and we come up with the agreement on how to do that. Yeah, I disagree that it's been denied. It just hasn't happened yet. And I, I, I frankly don't think it needs to. I think there's been a lot of collaboration here tonight. Um, I, I, just, I just want this, the semantics to be um, agreed upon in terms of what our working definition of a special meeting is in case we ever do need to have one. Um, and I, I just don't think, for me, that that doesn't cover what the MSBA, our governing body and support system who trains us on how to be a board member, says that there are three different reasons why we could have a special meeting. And then when we see that other, other um, surrounding districts are making use of special meetings um, for more than just a single purpose, I just want us to have a common definition of what a special meeting is, in case we need to use it. Well, also, and I think we need a definition of, of the authority to not, not have it occur, right? I mean, or to deny the request. Well, maybe it's semantics. Like, if it was, maybe it is. I think maybe it is semantics. Like, to me, a special meeting is like, this is unavoidable. We have to meet. That's an emergency meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it could be an emergency meeting. It could but, be an emergency you know, meeting, you know, but it, could it also be. could be a special meeting. But like, to me, like, a licious request is like a workshop, right? Like, a licious request for infor more information. She was basically requesting more information and discussion. And... That's to me. That's more like a workshop because this is not conducive to discussion as much as a workshop is, in my opinion. I would agree with that. Um, certainly, I think maybe the difference with distinction is that um, the triggering of a special meeting was it, it's in our policy to do that um, and as a new board and as board members as individuals we cannot just say I want to have a workshop um, and then magically we have a workshop so special meeting is a tool that is available to us as individuals who can then put this idea out there and if it gains traction from other board members then it should be something that we move forward with I understand that sitting like this might not have been the ideal situation for the topics um, that were proposed under the special meeting. However, it was the tool available to Alicia as an individual board member to initiate a meeting. I, I don't care I, how I don't which care is why how I supported happens. the idea. I just think we need more more opportunities and we need to have input in in scheduling those and, and um, it can't come from only the, you know, only from one individual. It needs to come from us as a group. I guess I don't really understand why you think it came from one individual. Did we all say what we thought was important and then well, the, the those things were put on the agenda? The request was made by three board members and then the chair indicated on November 20th that it would be scheduled and then it wasn't and then tonight we're hearing that it's her opinion that um, according to MSA or Robert rules that it's not an appropriate request. So. All right, well, if, so what is the special meeting going to be about then? I, I'm saying... Let's schedule it then. I, I, well, I'm not the person that's responsible for scheduling a special meeting. I, I, I mean, like I said, I think there's two separate issues. There's number one, we need to come up with a plan for identifying how we're going to do additional work that doesn't necessarily include, you know. Well, we did talk about that tonight in the fact of when we come back on the 20th, provide the information of what this additional work is. Um, quantify it. That's, that see what everybody believes needs to be addressed. And then we can work to prioritize those pieces. You know, th this wasn't intended again as an opinion piece it was trying to put some structure around us we do need to finish our training but we had that scheduled really early we didn't complete it in the allotted time other things did happen we did 
step out from that time, we did not finish our training. The first opportunity to get Eileen back to complete that is January 3rd. So it's scheduled to bring her back in to finish that training. I agree it needs to happen, it needs to happen fast. But we have training coming up in the next two meetings. We will have you know, our cybersecurity, we'll have our FOIA training, we can have, there's a law training that's on there. So we've got trainings that are continually happening. We need to give ourselves a moment to get all of that together because it won't happen immediately. It does take a little bit of time to understand that. Um, I appreciate the amount of work that we do have in front of us, and there is a lot. Um, looking just at you know, long-range planning, we've got a lot ahead of us. And that's really where those committees are so valuable. The liaison roles are so valuable because that's where the work happens. It does not happen behind a dais. Well, it can happen in the workshops too. But so my can question I make a suggestion that on for the next meeting because it would be helpful, I think, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone was given their assignments tonight and what they and who the chairs are. If the chairs could develop what their plan is for what their objective and goal is for their plan for their committee, when their meeting times and dates are for their committee, and what the structure is of how you're going to record and take notes and how you're going to disseminate that. So when you come back the next meeting, each chairperson of a committee has the structure already done with and, and presents it. So everyone has that information. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's great. I think I think now that we're on committees, it's going <laughs> to help a lot. I totally and and agree. can I can I clarify the that before the before the we're having time on the 20th before the business meeting training to discuss priorities? What did, what did we say that we were going to do that night? What is currently scheduled for December 20th's workshop is cybersecurity, FOIA training, mm -hmm. and um, student privacy laws. Right. So if you would like to have more time together, that's certainly possible as long as everyone can be there. Um, I think the other part to consider with the special meeting is that everyone has to be present um, to consider. You know, and all members of the board have to be present and agree to consider adding additional items. So I think part of the other challenge this month for all of you, as this is only your second meeting, um, <laughs> but folks have been traveling and are going to be traveling. And so it's really hard for you to do a, a norm setting and establishing priorities if you're not complete. Um, and so I, I think that's an added challenge to all of you. And, you know, Echoing what Sarah said, you come on at the most difficult time because there's a lot to do, um, a lot in the midst. Of, we're well into the school year, and you know, to the grading and reporting piece of it, that process was well underway before this board was established. Um, and so, I think part of the training that you're going to have is also going to help you clarify what is our like, what is our role? Where where do we need to be involved in making those decisions, and where do we just need to make sure that there's the right people in the right place doing those things on a day-to-day -day basis because we're doing a lot of things. We're sharing little pieces, little windows into our work with you, but we're um, we're, we're accomplishing a lot of things on a, day, on a daily and weekly basis Absolutely. in our jobs. Um, and so if you would like to, I, I mean, I think the challenge, and I'm happy to explore and find facilitators or um, facilitate myself or, you know, Monique is a great facilitator if she's available. Um, but you do need someone to help you facilitate that norm setting process and that prioritization process so that you can all fully participate in that. I, I believe that strongly. Um, it's hard right now, this time of year, leading up to the holiday and your meeting is right before the break, but I can certainly look and see. I'm open to ideas or suggestions, but um, well, I think, didn't that's Sarah say everyone was available starting at four? That well, that's what I was asking for clarification staff. on, because you talked about right. meeting before the business part of the so meeting on the just 20th. So why do you yeah. want to facilitate? Right. You know, we could, you could do a that's legal cool. training that day, which you learn about your roles and responsibilities through some of those legal guidelines as well, and we can see if we can get someone from Drummond and Woodson to come. If that feels helpful, Maybe that was Monique our original plan. facilitate. Um, I think it's more important to establish some norms and operating protocols. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we can't do that in a retreat, then I think we should take at least some of the time on the 20th to do that. 
And back to the special meeting, I mean, um, I'm sorry that that turned into a, a lively debate. Um, but I guess um, from my perspective, I'm willing to uh, um, withdraw my request for a special meeting, but uh, we don't have a policy about how that happens. And so it's been requested by three board members. I don't know if I can withdraw it. I okay. don't know if three board members can withdraw it. That was it. something that MSMA also provided guidance on. Um, I believe that was in the email that I had forwarded to everybody that yes, you can withdraw the request. Just one person? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I think we've done enough work in toward terms of planning that now it's, it's you know, we've got a, a good plan going forward on how to do it. Um, my concern was that I think we just need to be transparent. Like, the request was made. It was internal debate about it, and um, we differ in the translation on that. And I think that would be a good thing for us to address in policy moving forward. Any of the issues you have with agenda setting and how that works can be addressed. In yeah, I think that's been brought to the full board to talk mm -hmm. about. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it'll be. It's really good that the committees are formed, mm -hmm. yeah. and mm -hmm. it's Agreed. too bad that we had to wait a month. Basically, I mean, you know, because of the way the meetings worked out. But um, I do. I personally find that a lot, a lot of a lot more a lot of work gets done in the committee, and it feels. Um, yeah. That's where they work. It feels like you're doing more when you're working in committee because you're actually getting stuff done, and then you're bringing it to the board to vote on. And it just it it feels it feels better. Productive. Um, and Productive. So Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. It is getting late. I'm getting cranky. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it ends. So I know. One of the past ten o'clock. I know. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is something that I'll be looking for, or I think we all need to be looking towards, is when does the Scarborough Charter come back up for vote. There's a couple critical items that I'd love to see get on the agenda, one of them being that it is not a school budget that is voted on, but more importantly, when do we vote in Board of Ed members? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if we had had that opportunity for people to be here in the June election, we would have had a very quiet time when our teachers are on vacation, that we could have created all of this structure and norms and committees be underway so that when they came back and our students walked in on day one, we were already ahead of the game. We're playing catch up right now. So it's incumbent on us to try to enforce that change. A lot of communities vote their school board members. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense. Um, we have gone well beyond yeah. the 10 o'clock time. Um, Dylan, Kristen. If you'd like to go through the report, I I know you put a lot of effort into this. They've yeah. waited this long. They should. I know, and I am so sorry that we went this past the general time, and we will do our best to make sure that the meetings don't last this long. Do you need to do committee reports at all, or are you just yeah, no? Now we're skipping that. Yes. There are no committee reports because there were no committees. There were no committees. I worked on the newsletter. <laughs> yeah, we met about financials earlier. We're good. <laughs> you just said, made a video for the finance public. just <laughs> met. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> okay. So, getting back to the students report. Don't you have to extend the... Uh... Meeting. Yes, we do. We need to have an yes. motion. I don't. I, you don't have to extend the no, meeting. You just can't do new business. business. Oh, That's why you did your business first. So you guys right. can be here till. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. <laughs> the students are done. <laughs> Dylan. All right, Kristen. Take us home. Oh, it's the Mayflower. So I had the privilege of sitting in on a web, uh, Pleasant Hill, thank you, Pleasant Hill second grade social studies class. Um, this is a while back towards the beginning of November, but during this class, they were able to recap on the exciting presentation that the students had on Wednesday, which was November 7th. Um, and during this presentation, they learned about the Pilgrim's journey and about kind of the history of Thanksgiving, um, which was very exciting at this time with um, also fall themes and Thanksgiving upcoming, which has passed now, but back then. Um, 
-hmm. And then also during this class, I noticed that like there was a big emphasis on movement and exercise, which I thought was very interesting. And I can definitely see how that would positively affect students and it allowed them to be more focused during their learning time um, and kind of get their jitters out early before they actually sat down to learn. Um, and they took part in yoga, which I thought was also really interesting, and that was led by the teacher. Um, and the fifth grade band classes have just begun to work on a new schedule. Um, the Blue Learning Community and the Allied Arts team have been able to create groups of different instruments to practice at a time, rather than having all seven instruments practice together. These groups consist of all different instruments, and group one is percussion, alto saxophones, and clarinets. Group two is trumpets and flutes, and group three is trombones and or xylophones, um, which is a lot different than all of the instruments practicing together. It's definitely more focused on the specific instruments. Um, the academic benefits of this, um, of these new instrumental groupings have allowed students to grow their musical abilities and increase their overall ability to focus on their instrument and play their instrument. Um, the social benefits of this give students a greater sense of independence and it really prepares them for what they'll be experiencing in sixth grade and for the rest of their musical careers. And then Middle School Interact Club has just begun their month-long project of making blankets for the Dempsey Center, which is in Lewiston, Maine. And this is a great activity that the students love taking part in, and the Dempsey Center is also very fortunate and grateful that we donate these blankets to them. Um, at Eight Corners School during the November assembly, students were able to learn about the upcoming Hour of Code, which is actually happening this week. That's taking place at their school. Hour of Code is a global movement that introduces students to a one-hour lesson um, of com computer programming and computer science. And then before I move on to the high school, middle school really quick, I just wanted to mention that today Eight Corners became the second school in our district to switch from plastic to metal silverware. Oh, and so nice. In the following weeks we'll have Blue Point and Pleasant Hill also switching. And by the end of the year, with the help of Anna Gage and Peter Esposito, we will have switched the entire district over. We're also looking at different grants and ways to fund replacing all of our uh, disposable like mealware so we can try to eliminate as much waste as possible. Awesome. So I just wanted to quickly mention that. Uh -huh. And then, I don't know if any of you got a chance to see on the news, but some of the members of yeah. the SHS Ecos Group and Students Health with the Aquaponics System got a chance to be interviewed, part of the On Your Side segment that WGME hosts. And it was a whole segment on how the aquaponics system is implemented into the environmental science programs and how it works and what we're doing to not only like help with those curriculums, but also other parts of the school. The photo right on with the tomatoes, I took that like yesterday. And <laughs> it um, that's just an update on what the looking like. All the food that's grown in there goes towards the, uh, oh, what's the program called? The Teen Cooking Kitchen. Teen Cooking Kitchen. Mm -hmm. And that is a program done by the Academic Life Skills Group, which teaches them not only cooking and home ec skills, but also about economics and finance, as teachers can purchase lunch right from the program. Mm -hmm. um, for and anyone who got the chance, on Monday, November 19th, the mixed chorus had a mixed chorus and the newly formed a cappella group, formerly known as Jazz Chorus, um, <laughs> had an open dress rehearsal, uh, which unfortunately became their actual concert because there was a storm the next day. Um, <laughs> I got a chance to attend. I took some pictures. Uh, for those who were unable to see them perform at that one concert, they will be performing again next Wednesday night, as Leanne mentioned. Thursday, sorry. <laughs> wow. It's Thursday. It's Thursday. Anyway, yes, you will be able to see them again. I believe there will be some uh, chorus alum coming to sing too. So it'll be nice. What? Lots of Christmas music and fun, fun songs. Uh, again, winter concert. Also, it was yesterday. It was Thursday. Yes, yesterday. 
And I only had a few minutes to stop in and see it because I actually had to drop off some homework and I got I heard it, so I just walked in, took a picture. Um, but it was fantastic from what I heard. Um, as always, they do a phenomenal job putting this together. I am always blown away with the amount of work Miss Richardson and all of the different band instructors and teachers, tutors. I'm not really sure what the proper term is for them, but how they put this project and these concerts together. For anyone who gets a chance to go, I mean, you can see in the picture there's a packed audience. Yeah. It's always phenomenal. It is. <laughs> Another music thing. Um, on January 11, 2019, the Scarborough Band Boosters will be hosting a Scarborough's Got Talent to help raise money for the booster program. The show will feature students in the community and prizes, judges, MCs, and more will also be included. Their auditions will start on December 19th at SHS from 2.45 to 4.45, and then the next day from 2.30 to 4.30. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be super fun. I'm looking forward to it, and then... Can we enter a school board team in that? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely not. Um, <laughs> Public discussion on the talent for it's happening. <laughs> Um, a couple weeks ago, a group of five SHS seniors, who are also members of ECOS, got to take part in a trip with the Maine Youth Environmental Association and Citizens Climate Lobby to go to Washington, D.C. and meet with different staff from their representatives. And they, we, I, I also went, if you see in the picture, but uh, <laughs> we also met with Shelley Pingree. And I just thought it was a f fun thing to mention, because yeah. these trips happen all the time in our school. And we can only talk about it so often. <laughs> um, and then that's all I have. I tried to speak really fast. <laughs> so much good. There's Dylan, so I just have to say that you and Kristen have really upped the bar for mm -hmm. student yeah, reports. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is amazing. I, awesome. I so look forward to your report each. Um, and I love how you do all the different phase levels. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And actually go in classrooms and observe. That's mm -hmm. amazing. That's amazing. You guys are awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Anytime. Okay. All right. With that, again, thank you guys. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Damn, I was ready to count. All those in favor? <laughs> you six and two. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I didn't care. I'm like, Queen Cranky.